Mic check one, two, everyone. Please, at this time, find your seat. We're going to be starting. At this time, please find your seat. We will be starting. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to uh, my first hearing. Uh, I am Council Member Joe Borelli, and I am the newly formed uh, chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I would like to start by thanking all of you who are here today to discuss the very important topic of diversity in the New York City Fire Department. This is the first hearing of this committee, so I would like to take a few moments, moments to introduce our committee members and give a brief description of the committee's purview. Uh, right now, we have joining us uh, a, uh, Council Member Cabrera. Councilmember Diaz and Councilmember King, as well as Councilmember Mizell and Councilmember Brannon. I also want to thank our committee staff, uh, Brian Crow, William Hognatch, Josh Kingsley, Jin Lee, and Aisha Wright, and my chief of staff, Frank Mascia. The committee oversees the FDNY and the city's emergency medical services, which is principally responsible for firefighting as well as first responder medical services. While the fire commissioner administers the fire department, the chief of the department commands the uniformed services, which consists of more than one, uh, 11,000 firefighters, FDNY, EMS, is staffed by approximately 4,400 emergency personnel, also known as EMTs, paramedics, and supervisors who are assigned to 37 EMS stations citywide. FDNY EMS happens to be the largest municipal emergency service system in the United States. The committee also oversees the Office of Emergency Management, OEM is a charter agency tasked with coordinating the city's multi-agency response to all emergency conditions and potential incidents which affect public health and safety, such as severe weather, threats from natural hazards and natural disasters, power and other public service outages, hazards and substance discharges, building collapses, aviation disasters, acts of terrorism. In addition to coordinating multi-agency response, OEM is responsible for planning and emergency preparation, including educating the public about preparedness and collecting and disseminating critical information to key stakeholders and the public during emergencies. This committee has a broad purview and it is my intention to routinely focus on all of the subject matter we oversee, and I look forward to working with all of you in doing so. Regarding the subject of today's meeting, we are here to discuss diversity in the FDNY. During last session, the former Committee on Fire and Criminal Justice Services addressed this issue through several oversight and budget hearings. The FDNY has since made a series of improvements to its hiring process from addressing deficiencies in, in its FST exam, bolstering female and minority recruitment efforts. Additionally, to help create a more diverse culture from the top down, the department promoted two women to their executive team. I applaud the department's enhanced efforts in addressing the underrepresentation in the FDNY of minorities and women. That being said, the number of women and minority firefighters remains extremely low relative to other firefighting agencies across the city. For example, the current number of FDNY female fighters, uh, firefighters is 68, which is approximately 0.6% of the 11,000 plus city firefighters. I believe that we can all agree that this is unacceptable. It is my hope that with today's hearing, we can continue this important conversation and keep working on a solution to better provide a better road for minorities and women to become one of New York City's bravest. Speaker, I'd like to call upon uh, our, our distinguished speaker to also offer some opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair Borelli. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you, Commissioner. Congratulations, First Deputy Commissioner. Great to see you. Um, good morning. I want to thank you all for being here today to discuss the important issues facing the FDNY and its lack of diversity amongst firefighters. I want to thank Chair Borelli and members of the new Fire and Emergency Management Committee for organizing and holding this important hearing. The FDNY is made up of uh, highly skilled women and men willing to risk their lives on a daily basis to protect us, and we as a city are very thankful for their service. This council, Chair Borelli, and the committee members are committed to working with the fire department to enhance public safety and the safety of members of the FDNY. However, even in the great, greatest fire department, uh, it can improve, and we are committed to working with the department to make those improvements, especially in the area of diversity. 
The historic lack of diversity in the FDNY has been a serious problem, as you all know, and the issues facing the department that we're going to discuss today are not new. For decades, the department routinely discriminated against women and minorities and only truly began integrating these communities into their workforce when they were forced to by court orders after losing numerous lawsuits filed on behalf of women and minority groups. The result of this historical discrimination is evident today. According to DCAS, the FDNY has the second lowest percentage of women employees of any city agency at only 10 percent, and the number was much lower, as you heard from Chair Borelli, as it related to firefighters. The department lags behind only the Department of Sanitation with its 9 percent female workforce, as compared to 34 percent of the NYPD and 44 percent of the Department of Correction. And of that 10 percent cohort of female employees, we know that virtually all of them are in non-firefighting positions because, again, as Chair Borelli said, only 0.6 percent of firefighters are women. Let me say that again. 0.6 percent of firefighters are women. We also know from DCAS that the fire department is among the least racially diverse agencies in the city. Only 31 percent of the FDNY's workforce is non-white, compared to 61 percent of the NYPD and 86 percent of the Department of Correction. The FDNY is quite simply out of step with other city agencies and other firefighting departments across the country when it comes to diversity. Fortunately, we have seen a renewed focus on fixing these problems from this administration and from this department, and I want to thank you, Commissioner Nigro, for your commitment to this issue. But we are going to keep pushing you to do even better. So far, the results are promising. Record numbers of women and minorities are applying uh, to become firefighters. Record numbers of women and minorities are actually becoming firefighters, which I'm sure you're going to detail in your testimony today. And the department's upper management has grown significantly more diverse as well. As I look at the panel in front of me, that is quite evident, and I am so happy to see this here today. Unfortunately, we still have a long way to go. <clears throat> and this council will continue to examine this, this issue regularly until the FDNY begins to reflect the diversity of those that they serve. I look forward to productive discussion of these issues today, and I want to thank everyone for engaging in this important issue. Uh, before I turn it back to uh, Chair Borelli, I want to congratulate the Chair on his appointment to this uh, very, very important uh, committee. Uh, even though he and I, of course, disagree on many things, I am really grateful that the first hearing that he's having as Chair of this committee is on this issue, which is diversity in the FDNY amongst women and minorities. This is a nonpartisan issue. This is an issue about getting the best and the brightest and ensuring that the FDNY, again, reflects the diversity of our city. And so I am uh, grateful and excited that Chair Borelli agreed to take this position. And I look forward to working with him, the members of this committee, the members of the council, the mayor's office, and with you, Commissioner Nigro, and your staff to ensure that we do even better. That 0.6 number has to come up significantly, and this council wants to support you in whatever way we can to ensure that happens rapidly and that we sustain it moving forward in the years and decades to come. So with that, I turn it back over to our chair, Chair Borelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for appointing me. And, and any time you want to come and say nice things about me, I mean, this, this certainly the floor is always Don't get used point. to it. <laughs> um, so now we will uh, administer the oath uh, and begin with our testimony. Um, you do that? Yeah. Do all of you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, please uh, welcome and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, good morning, Chairman Borelli. Good morning, Speaker. Thank you for your support. Uh, good morning to all council members present. My name is Dan Nigro. I'm the Commissioner of the Fire Department. I'm joined this morning by First Deputy Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh, Deputy Commissioner Cecilia Loving, who is the Department's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Assistant Commissioner Nafisa Noonan, who oversees the Bureau of Recruitment and Retention, and Assistant Commissioner Don Wynn, who oversees our Bureau of Equal Employment and Opportunity. 
thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about diversity in the FDNY. As I've stated bef before this council and in many venues across the city, it is a top priority of my administration to create a more diverse, more inclusive, and more equitable FDNY. Diversity and inclusion are key values of this department. We know that these values enhance our strength and fortitude as an institution. We strive to create a department that reflects the people of the city that we serve. This commitment starts at the top. For virtually the entirety of its history, the New York City Fire Department has been led by men, but we've made great strides in short period of time. We were honored to have you, Chairman Borelli, present for a promotion ceremony last week, during which I swore in the second ever female first deputy commissioner and the first female chief of staff in the history of the fire department. During my administration, I've also appointed the first black female deputy chief and the first female fire department chaplain and the first two chief diversity and inclusion officers, both of whom were women of color. Never in its history has the department been run by a leadership team as rich in diversity, including women and people of color, and our team has produced dramatic advances in this mission. Diversifying our ranks means an evolution of the way re we recruit candidates. The vision statement of our Office of Diversity and Inclusion holds that the excellence of the New York City Fire Department is enhanced by the ability to recruit, hire, retain, and promote highly skilled, talented, and motivated members from diverse backgrounds. FDNY prides itself in attracting candidates of diverse gender, age, culture, race, religious preference, and sexual orientation because the expression of unique ideas provides for better productivity, efficiency, and service to a diverse and multifaceted community. Our most recent firefighter exam was given last fall, and the recruit, recruiting campaign leading up to it was an unprecedented effort to expand and diversify the applicant pool by attracting more women and people of color than ever before. This $10 million effort developed aggressive goals for recruiting black, Latino, Asian, and female candidates. We also focused on amplifying our recruitment of LGBTQ candidates and military veterans. We conducted more than 10,000 recruitment events and collected approximately 200,000 expressions of interest. We trained and employed a team of over 1,000 recruiters, including active duty firefighters, to reach underrepresented communities. Our members recruited at high schools, colleges, community celebrations, subway stations, cultural events, youth gatherings, and career fairs. We also held a large number of our own dedicated recruiting events, including hosting summer block parties in every borough and events for potential candidates at the FDNY Training Academy. We created the Mobile Academy, which allowed our recruiters to conduct training exercises out in the community. Potential applicants were also able to participate in activities from the Candidate Physical Ability Test, CPAT, which is required of candidates to become firefighters. Our recruitment team worked in tandem with our Community Affairs Unit, broadening the reach of our recruitment efforts and strengthening relationships with community boards and groups with shared missions. We realized the challenge of reaching underrepresented communities on our own so we also partnered with outside groups to help us reach potential applicants. We worked with organizations such as the New York Urban League, Make the Road New York, the LGBTQ Center, the Dominican Women's Development Center, 100 Black Men, Non-Traditional Employment for Women, the Center for Family Life in Sunset Park, and many others. We looked at what was working with military entities and other domestic fire departments. We consulted with recruiting experts and employed marketing and media specialists to design a targeted communication strategy that involved social media, focus group message testing with our target audience, and modern print and video ads in subway stations, bus stops, billboards, firehouses, and any location we determine 
would be effective for attracting candidates. We implemented significant innovation in our use of technology and data analytics, and the effect was significant. We sent more than 1.7 million email communications to potential candidates. We conducted more than 150,000 phone calls to interested recruits. 14,771 applicants attended an FDNY in-person tutorial session and 8,600 applicants downloaded online tutorial material to help them prepare for the exam. When it came time for applicants to take the exam, our recruitment efforts produced record-breaking results. We succeeded in drawing interest in a firefighting career for more young men and women than ever before. A record-setting 46,300 people took the exam. For the first time ever, a majority of test takers were people of color, a total of 26,000. More women than ever took the exam at 4,181, which is more than twice as many as took the prior exam in 2012. Looking at individual ethnicities, improvement from the prior exam were dramatic. The number of Asian test takers increased by 55%. Black test, test takers increased by 39%. Latino test takers increased by 29%. Native American test takers increased by 35%. And the number of female test takers who took the exam improved by 115%. Our recruitment efforts are also bolstered by the department's association with the Captain Vernon A. Richards High School for Fire and Life Safety. We work in collaboration with the school to introduce the high school population to the benefits of a career with the fire department. And many of these New York City students go on to become FDNY EMTs and firefighters. I also want to update the committee on our efforts to recruit military veterans to the ranks of the FDNY. The department has a long history of involvement with the United States Armed Forces and we found that former members of the military often make extraordinary firefighters, EMTs, officers, and civilian staff. Our members share a number of characteristics with members of the military, including a commitment to public service, possessing responsibility and discipline, maintaining physical fitness, and are willing to make sacrifices for the benefit of others. Currently, there are 1,200 uniformed FDNY members in the fire ranks, who are military reservists or veterans. 431 have been hired since 2013. When combined with the members in EMS and civilians, that number increases to 1,443, or just over 8% of the department, and we are proud of every one of them. We also take great pride in the 44 FDNY personnel who are currently on extended military orders including Firefighter Rory Allen of Ladder 165. Firefighter Allen is returning home next week from a sh for a short leave from his current deployment to Afghanistan, which is his fourth tour in the region. In 2015, the department created a military outreach coordinated position to focus specifically on increasing the representation of veterans within our ranks. We strive to accomplish this by maximizing recruitment opportunities for veterans and raising awareness of an FDNY career among active duty members of the armed forces. In the most recent firefighter recruitment campaign, we held 112 veteran-specific recruitment events. This included participating in three large-scale events conducted via the Hiring Our Heroes program, which is run by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. At these programs, two at Joint Base McGuire-Dix Lakehurst and one at the 69th Regiment Armory, our military outreach coordinator and recruiters met with potential candidates at events that were attended by more than 1,300 active duty members who were transitioning out of the military. While the number is not final and could increase, we know that almost 2,200 of the individuals who took the firefighter exam last fall have identified as having military veteran status. Our military outreach team has been escalating efforts on multiple fronts to reach potential candidates in the military. We think that there's real value in building relationships with members of the armed services 
before they are looking to transition out of the military. And we like to engage them even as early as the point where they enter military service. We are negotiating and expecting to complete within the next 60 days a memo of understanding with the U.S. Army's Partnership for Youth Success Program, which will give us the ability to work with new soldiers over the course of their time in the Army and prepare them to apply to the FDNY upon completion of honorable service. We are working on a similar program with the United States Marine Corps that will enable us to connect with new Marines prior to them attempting boot camp. Perhaps the best examples of ways in which we reach out to members of the military as early as possible in their career are the department's partnerships with CUNY ROTC and Francis Lewis High School Junior ROTC. We work with individual members to develop a plan to apply to the FDNY when they exit the military. We have also entered into a partnership with NYC Fleet Week that enables us to set up recruiting stations at multiple locations during the week to speak with current sailors and veterans about joining the FDNY. We've hosted many events for Fleet Week military visitors in our firehouses. Our military outreach team has engaged with more than 15 military units, eight military installations, more than 20 veterans groups at educational institutions, and more than a dozen veteran service organizations. And we will continue to expand our efforts as we identify successful avenues for recruiting veterans to join the department. Chairman Borelli, I know that you have a particular interest in this area, and I look forward to working with you to grow our outreach to members of the military. Finally, we have made extensive advancements in recent years in addressing diversity and inclusion issues within the department. During my time as commissioner, we created the position of chief diversity and inclusion officer, appointed a new diversity advocate, and convened the fire commissioner's diversity and inclusion committee. We launched a vision, mission, and goal statement for diversity and inclusion, which is now displayed in department facilities. We have designed and published eight issues of a new quarterly newsletter on diversity and inclusion, and we host multicultural events on an almost monthly basis, including a Martin Luther King Jr. celebration, a variety of Black History Month events, a Women's Empowerment Summit, Pride Celebration events, and many others. I was pleased last year to host the first ever Seder at FDNY headquarters, which was attended by numerous rabbis and faith and community leaders from across the city, as well as department employees of all backgrounds. We make sure that probationary firefighters understand our diversity and inclusion values in several ways, including on their first day at the academy and through meetings with affinity groups. The CDIO also meets with the trainers and instructors before each new class. The department also developed a new diversity and inclusion training unit with over 20 members of the department serving as trainers. This new unit has been very active. We created an e-platform so that we can make trainings, information, and resources widely available. And we designed LGBTQ and unconscious bias training modules. Over 13,000 members of the department have now received EEO and unconscious bias training and supervisors and frontline staff have received LGBTQ training. We've put an increased emphasis on mentoring, and we held a speed mentoring event and plan to hold more in the coming year. It is not a simple task to drive cultural evolution in an organization that is as large and carries as much history as the New York City Fire Department. We know that we face and will continue to face challenges in these areas, but I have made a personal commitment to improve the diversity of this department. As I have said since the moment I arrived as commissioner, we serve a diverse city, and if our department doesn't reflect that city, we're not doing our job. We strive every day to further that goal, and I am proud of the progress we've attained during my administration. I thank the Council for its attention to these important issues and for its ongoing support of our mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, and I, I certainly uh, 
will commend you because there is uh, significant evidence that things are looking better than they were uh, you know, prior to you joining us. Uh, I did uh, commit to giving Councilmember King the first question because he has to attend uh, another hearing. So, Councilmember King. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate you, Commissioner, and your team for being here today. And uh, thank you again for your agenda item of making sure that diversity, fairness um, is applied throughout the fire department and your efforts to make sure that we improve the numbers when it comes to ethnicity makeup of the FDNY. Um, with that being said, I just want to, you know, just have one question because as we fight for diversity and respect, whether it's um, in the uh, EMT workers or our firefighters, um, you know, in December, um, the council, we had a conversation. We sent a letter to you in regards to one of your recruits um, by the name of Joe Cassano, and we wanted to know at that point when he was being brought back in as a firefighter, um, his past history demonstrated that uh, he had actions of bigotry and prejudice against the people in New York that he had to serve. So my question would be to you, how does FDNY uh, moving forward um, take into account people who have demonstrated a history of not respecting diversity, which in a city which we respect diversity and we demand respect for diversity, how do we allow individuals who have a, a, a known history to come into the department to serve the city of New York um, as being a firefighter? And secondly, what kind of message are we sending to communities of color when we have someone who's demonstrated bigotry and hatred in tweets from 2013 that forced him to resign as opposed to being terminated, but now today gets hired in the month of December as a firefighter? No, oh, thank you. Um, I would say, hopefully, all of us in this room would not be judged eternally by uh, our worst day or our worst statements or our worst actions ever. And I think it was uh, clear in what you stated that these these tweets occurred in 2013. Subsequent to that, um, this candidate came back as an EMT and has served the city proudly as in that role uh, for a number of years before qualifying for the firefighter test. What we believe in in this administration is a second chance for folks, um, that people who show remorse, who take action to uh, improve themselves, can uh, come back and have a career in the fire department, a successful career. So um, in this case, this candidate and many others uh, who might have had indiscretions in at some point in their life have been given a second chance and given an opportunity and it is this department's belief that these people can change and can be successful. So with that being said, I want to thank you for your answer and I'm praying moving forward that if there is a person of color which you're trying to make sure are part of FDNY, if they have an indiscretion that that's considered just as this young man was considered because I don't want to, you know, be um, I'm trying to put it nicely. I just don't want it to apply to one set of people in the city of New York, and it doesn't apply to another set of folks. In the, in, we've known the history of this country, and we can say for Caucasians, things work one way, and then when it comes to everyone else, things operate differently. That's why we're here talking about how do we bring more uh, people of color in the fight into the system, but that means we got to treat them equally as, uh, um, with the same privileges that we're treating those who said they've made a mistake who are not people of color. My, la my next question and my last question would be, as you do more recruitment, and I saw the numbers that you've said, how many blacks have taken the test, is there a system in place right now to assure that those people of color who have passed the test, who qualify, get into the fire department? Because as we understand, whether um, some of our Caucasian brothers who get into the fire department sometimes go through the side door, whether it's through promotional exams to get into get into the fire, be a firefighter, while there may be a number of people from the communities of color who might have made the number, but because of spots and slots and how things are manipulated, if I can say, that they still don't get a chance to be firefighters. So what mechanisms do we have in place for our best and brightest people of color who have passed the exam that they actually get in without having to fight any other uh, systems that might be in place? Well, certainly you can be assured that there are no double standards in this department as it exists today under this administration, and that uh, the department did not uh, extend an extraordinary effort to recruit people of color. Um, 
in, in order to not have them transition into the department. It was the department's desire to make ourselves more diverse. So we will ensure that those people who want to become members of this department and qualify will become members of the department and that anything that may have occurred in the past uh, to diminish that, their ability to come in, will not occur under this administration. Well, I thank you for your answers, and I'll definitely look forward to working. We all looking forward to working with you. And then if someone who is part of your team or is a firefighter, if they mess it up, hold them accountable day one. They don't get a chance to mess it two and three times because a mess up can kill, can save, will not save lives, but can kill lives. So I thank you again for your time, and Mr. Chair. I appreciate you, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so we have the statistics that uh, the department has reported from the 2012 test, um, and we can see that there have been some gains in uh, hiring people of color and women. If we, if we play that out over the next 15 or 20 years, what does, what, paint a picture for us of the Department of 2030 if we continue at the same rate from the 2012 exam. Well, um, as you can see, in the previous test, we have made great advances. Um, we're certainly nowhere near where we need to be. We do believe that with our recruitment effort for this past test in the fall, that we will improve upon the numbers that we had from the 2012 test. So as you say, if we want to extrapolate and move forward, we do believe this department will reflect the population of our city at some point in the future. The department will continue uh, to pursue a path of diversity and will consider to, uh, will continue uh, to improve these numbers and uh, the department will finally be where it should be. Um, so again, looking at the 2012 uh, test results and going through the, the DCAS steps, um, it would seem that there's a higher percentage of, percentages, not raw numbers, but percentages of African American and Hispanic candidates who pass the test and are invited to take the physical exam than there are of white candidates. So if the percentages are, are higher at that stage where people are passing, invited to take the, the physical portion of the exam, where do you, do you as the agency find the, the drop-off occurring? I think Laura can best address that. Um, so we lose the vast majority of candidates of all races, but especially among um, black, Latino, and female candidates to voluntary attrition. Um, so they don't show up to the various hiring steps. And that's one of the things we've been working on. One of the things we've found in doing our focus groups is that candidates who've spent a lot of time thinking about this job and studying this job are far more likely to move on in the process. Um, part of it is because it's a very complex and um, long process. So you really need to know you want this job and you need to understand what that means. Um, and so a lot of what we've implemented in recruitment are things that recruit candidates earlier, give them more information. They actually get mentors at a certain point now. Um, and we hope to see the effects of that in the future being that the more of these candidates we recruit and speak to and have in our system for years, uh, the less we see that voluntary attrition as they go so, through. So the you're saying it, it is safe to say um, that there is um, a likelihood that many of the people who passed who are black and Hispanic are are causing their own attrition due to the lag between the time they sign up for the exam and from their eventual date of hiring. I wouldn't say they're causing their own attrition, but I would say that um, all candidates well, well, life quality, they get other jobs. Yeah, all candidates of all races um, are far more likely to take another job, and we found this out through focus groups, than to wait for the fire department job. Um, the reason for that slight difference um, among different races and different genders that we found was usually how sort of well prepared they were to wait those years or whether or not they even knew that they might need to wait years. Mm -hmm. And so we have seen that gap narrow. We hope eventually it goes away once we've been doing these recruitment methods over a number of years. Have, have you guys suggested to DCAS that they move to uh, a, a, a shorter lag between tests 
Could they go to a two-year test? Could they go to a one-year test, continuous testing? Yeah, so we've, uh, dis we've discussed this with DCAS. We've discussed it with NYPD, actually, who've, who's done more experimenting than we have in terms of test cycles. And then we've talked to a number of other departments about it throughout the nation who've tried this. Um, and all of them found that it didn't make a difference one way or another in terms of race. Um, mostly for us, that's because our hiring is quite slow because um, our members retire at a fairly low rate. They really like their jobs. Um, but that affects recruitment in the sense that no matter when or how we give the test or in what format, our hiring remains slow. Very few people retire, which means bringing on a much lower number of recruits than most other agencies. Um, so I think it's probably best to say we found that on diversity, we would be agnostic as to when the test is given. Um, it wouldn't make a huge difference in our end. Numbers, although we're open, you know, to ways to make it easier. And, and, and do you find that would also hold true for women, or, or is that Yeah, a, a when separate? we've looked at it, um, I, I believe NYPD had a rolling test cycle at one point, and they actually um, halted doing that um, because they also found it didn't make a difference in who was hired. It may have made a difference um, in certain steps along the way, but it ultimately did not result um, in greater diversity or lesser diversity. It simply didn't make a difference. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'll turn it over to the speaker for some questions. Uh, thank you again, Commissioner. I have a few questions, and again, congratulations, First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh. So um, when I was looking at the uh, background material in preparation for this hearing today, I saw that the uh, 2007 uh, Department of Justice lawsuit, uh, it was actually by the Vulcan Society, uh, put in place some mechanisms so that um, people of color who apply get some type of priority. Is that correct? I think that uh, that part of it, those people were hired, uh, they call priority hires that the judge put into place. We hired 170 people who we, you know, were affected by previous exams and those people were brought into the department um, in, in a different manner than others. So, but women were not included on that priority. Right? They were not. So why? Well, I, I believe this suit that was brought by the Justice Department and joined by the Vulcan Society I, I know, did not I know address the, that. I know the suit, but the issue is the, the United Women Firefighters Organization was going to potentially uh, file their own litigation uh, similarly in the way that the Vulcan Society did. But I believe there were conversations that took place between the FDNY and uh, UFW to say, don't do that, we'll work with you, and we'll figure out a way to make this happen, is my understanding. Um, no? Jump in if I'm wrong here. Um, so I would say sort of separating lawsuits out from policy. Uh, so the lawsuit with the Vulcans only covers um, black and Latino candidates, and we cannot give any candidate, regardless of race or gender, priority in the process as a matter of law, um, other than what the judge prescribed. We were able to do it in that case because a federal judge prescribed that for us. Um, in terms of working with the UWF on matters of policy, um, we have worked with them extensively. We meet with them constantly. I'd say almost everything you saw in the testimony and some other things we can speak about regarding women um, come at the behest of the commissioner and the department working with the UWF to figure out what the best methods are. So everything involving women um, we implemented because we wanted to was not part of a lawsuit. What percentage of EMTs and paramedics are women or people of color? Um, about 25% of our EMTs and paramedics are women and about 60% are people of color. So instead of waiting for the uh, four-year cycle, it's a four-year cycle to take the test, right? Correct. If you are already an FDNY employee, if you're an EMT, and I'm surprised this wasn't in your testimony, if you are an EMT or a paramedic and you're a woman or a person of color, you could get a promotion to firefighter instead of going through the same process that someone who's not currently in the FDNY. How come we are not seeing more promotions from within from EMTs and paramedics amongst women and people of color who are already employees of the FDNY? Uh, so the commissioner asked us to look at that, uh, asked recruitment to look at that, and we did so over the past couple of years um, and actually founded the first ever EMS recruitment unit um, in recruitment for that exact reason. So we now work on both um, better recruitment for EMS, but also 
helping any members of EMS who wish to promote and sort of educating them about that opportunity. Uh, and in this promotional exam that was given last year, that was the first time ever that we had done that work in terms of actually speaking to our own members uh, who are already quite diverse about the opportunities uh, on the fire side. And of course, every EMT or paramedic does not want to promote. You know, many love their jobs, um, but we do hope uh, in the future this EMS recruitment unit and the work that recruitment has done will uh, show a much better path from EMS to fire for women and people of color. When was that unit created? Uh, I think it was two years ago, Nafisa. For EMS? Yeah. Right. Well, we've actually um, recently put more. If you, could, if you could turn the mic on and speak directly into it. Right, so we've been doing EMS specific recruitment for a little over two years. Um, but in addition to that recruitment, we are recently hiring a director specifically for EMS recruitment um, because one of our new pipelines is EMT trainee. And that gives, an, gives us an opportunity to focus our recruitment efforts towards young people that are New York City residents, that are, of course, very diverse, and um, start you know, engaging them early about the promotion process. Yes, becoming EMTs, possibly medics, but also the opportunity to promote and become a firefighter. So there are 11,000 uniformed firefighters in the FDNY currently. How many EMTs and paramedics are in the FDNY? Currently um, about 4,500 EMTs, paramedics, and EMS officers. So uh, what I'm about to say, I do not say with a broad brush, I do not say to stereotype or disrespect uh, hardworking uh, firefighters, New York's bravest, who do an amazing job. But I want to say that given the history that we've all acknowledged, that you've acknowledged in the past, Commissioner, that you outlined in your testimony and that I outlined in my opening statement, uh, there of course have been issues over the years and over decades which has resulted in lawsuits. And as I said, I'm very, I mean, really, I'm very happy to see that your top leadership in the FDNY is, I think, way more reflective of New York City uh, than the rank and file. When First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh answered a question from Chair Borelli related to why are we seeing a drop off? Why are we seeing women and people of color go through certain steps, and then eventually not proceed further. Could potentially part of the reason, which uh, might be anecdotal, and I don't know if we can even get statistics on this, it's more maybe doing more focus groups of people that have dropped off, the fact that they start going through the process and then they realize, I'm a woman, I'm a person of color, and I may not want to be in a in, in a culture, in a firehouse setting where I'm the only one? Certainly that is something that we have been working very hard to overcome and certainly that exists. One cannot deny that it's difficult to convince the thousands of women in our city who are capable of doing the job of a firefighter that that is a career that they would enjoy. Um, the more we realize Ten, that- Tens of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Perhaps hundreds of thousands, certainly tens of thousands yes. who are capable. Um, and we do believe that there is a tipping point, and part of what the, you know, what the judge has ordered, part of the solution is that when people of color see more people of color in this department, as they see them on the fire, on the fire engines, as they see them in the neighborhood supermarket, they say, that's a career I want, that's a career for me, and they will be more numbers, and we believe we are reaching that point, we are reaching that tipping point where more and more people see it as a career that they will not only be accepted in, but excel in. And, and we're certainly getting closer and closer to that point, and, and your point is well taken. Uh, explain that to me. Uh, how are you getting, uh, this is not me criticizing you, this is me, I really want to understand this. How are you getting closer and closer to that point when it's still 0.6 percent? Well. Uh, women, you know, let's separate the two Okay, the two let's groups. separate these I out. Think, I, I, I think with women, our job is much more difficult. And as you see, we, we've attracted a few thousand now to take the exam. Now it's our job to keep moving them in the system, keep, keep them interested in this as a career. Um, as far as people of color, many of our units now in, in neighborhoods that are reflective of people of color the units that they see have 
many, many more African American firefighters on those apparatus. So that, that's what I was saying. We're getting much closer to that point where these young folks uh, in, in a neighborhood look up at, at that firehouse and see half of the people perhaps on a tour are people of color. And that's a complete game changer of this equation. If we could do the same at that same pace with women, I believe the same thing would occur. But as you know, 0.6% were so far down that it is with great difficulty um, to, to increase that number drastically and quickly in the civil service system as it exists. So what is the, uh, I'm going to end with this and then hand it back over to the chair and the other members that are here to ask questions. What is the goal? What's the number? What's the five-year goal? We're at this number today. We hope that through all of our efforts, through our uh, recruitment campaign, through the money we've put in, through hiring a talented, capable, diverse leadership team, our goal is what? What's the goal? Well, our goal is to reflect. What's the number? What's the number? Uh, what's the number in the city right now? Uh, you know, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be un, uh, untrue if I said this. More than 50% women in our city, so our goal should be to have a department. Um, not in my lifetime, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I want a but realistic number. A, a realistic number is to get beyond that whatever the tipping point is. I think a realistic number for people of color in our city, in our department, is more than 50%. We're at what right now? Reflect the city. What, what's the percentage right now? Uh, it's certainly far below that right now. We're about 20%. About, what are we at? About 20%. 20. We're at 20%. Yeah. Correct. Amongst We're firefighters. At, amongst firefighters. When uh, can we get, but I'm saying, when can we get to 50%? Uh, I would say that would take at least a few more exams, which come every four years. So we're talking uh, eight to decade. 12 years. Okay. Yeah, sure. And then women, what's the goal? So I'd say with women, one of the things we've tried to study is what is the number in departments who have successfully done this, whether via court or uh, on their own or in the Army. And that sort of number right now is 15% nationwide. We expect that probably changes, right? Hopefully young women you know, have sort of less maybe gender constraints um, as they grow up. That's what we hope at least in society and maybe that number goes up and we'll need to adjust accordingly. Uh, but at least as of right now, 15% seems to be the s number for success for departments who've um, been able to do this over 15 years or so. So you want to go from uh, optimally 0.6% to 15% over the course of potentially a, three exams. A few cycles, which yeah. Is, I mean, we hope to do it faster, obviously, because faster. some of this is driven by so, retirement. So I would love, and I'm going to end with this, I would love to, um, we should be held accountable as a council, you should be held accountable as the FDNY, and I would love to see a plan about, if that is the goal, 50% amongst people of color, over three, because you said a few, uh, exam cycles, and 15% <clears throat> amongst women over three exam cycles, I would love to see that broken out with a real roadmap and a real plan of the number of women and people of color per exam cycle, <clears throat> the budget dollars you need to actually get that done, and to have a real roadmap. So I would ask that... Um, before the budget hearing, which will take place for the FDNY, the preliminary budget hearing, which will take place in March, to at least have some preliminary roadmap to share with us at that budget hearing so we can delve more deeply into the questions we've asked today as we put forward an FDNY budget as a city to make sure that you have the resources you need to execute that plan and execute that roadmap going forward. Thank you. Okay. So you'll have that roadmap by the preliminary... Sure. Thank you, Commissioner you Nigro. And congratulations again, First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank, Thank you all very much. Thank Chair Burley. Mr. Speaker, uh, j just to follow up on his question before I hand it over, um, it, the, the number of women hires from the 2012 exam were all, according to my math, under 3 or 4 percent. Can we say we're, we're meeting any, any type of goal with that? Um, I, In terms I, of actual numbers of women hired? I would not say we're meeting where we want to be. Um, what we've tried to do between the 2012 exam and this one was um, at least double those numbers, which we did in terms of the percentage of the women in the pool. Um, and we hope to do that 
again on the next exam. What we saw in other departments once they began this work is the women's numbers sort of gained traction over time um, by sort of leaps and bounds, that once they were actually talking to women in the community, it took them a few years to actually see the results of that work. Um, so our first goal was to double the percentage in this pool, which we did meet, um, but we would hope to double that again in our next exam. But over four years, the number actually stayed almost exactly the same in terms of women hired. It was, I think, eight graduates every year. Are you, are you limited, though, in some capacity by the fact that you have to go on a test for four years? Yeah, so I was going to say, um, you know, the last test in 2012, um, this administration did not recruit for that exam. We were involved in um, getting those candidates through the process, so I can't sort of speak to what their initial goal was or why that number, you know, why it is that sort of consistent eight number, but we are constrained by the list. You know, once the list is set after we do the recruitment for that exam, um, we have to take people in the order they appear on the list. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Diaz, please. Thank you, Mr. S Mr. S Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, there I, I want to follow the line of questioning of the speaker, Speaker Johnson. And, and I have to say that there was an old <clears throat> TV commercial was an old lady used to ask, where is the beef? And I'm, I'm saying that because I read four pages of your testimony where you claim all the things that you have done to bring the number of minorities, black and Hispanic, to, to a, an acceptable a position. You said, our most recent reason fire fighter exam was given last fall, and the recruit, recruiting campaign leading up was an unprecedented effort to expand and di diversify the applicant pool by attracting more women and people of color. $10 million effort developed aggressive goal for recruiting black, Latino, Asian, female, and female candidates. You continue saying, we conducted more than 10,000 recruitment events and collected approximately 200,000 expression of interest. We train and recruit and uh, recruitment event and employ a team of over 1,000 recruitment. Then you say, you keep, you keep saying all the things that you have done to do that. You say, <clears throat> when it came time for applicants to take the exam, our recruitment effort produced record-breaking results we succeeded in, in drawing interest in firefighting career for, for more, from more young men and women than ever before. A record setting, 46,300 people took the exam. For the first time, you said, ever, a majority of test takers were people of color, a total of 26,000 more women than ever before took the exam. And then you continue saying, looking at individual ethnicity, improvement from the prior exam were dramatic. The number of Asian test takers increased by 55%. Black test takers increased by 39%. Latino test takers increased by 29%. I, I, I was reading, I was, I, I was assuming that at the end of your four pages, you would say, as a result of all of this effort and thing that I had done, now the department could probably say, we employ, uh, we have increased the number of Hispanic so to, that, to such a level, the number of of black women, and this is out of so many employees, now we got this at the corner. But you didn't say that. So my question, where's the beef? Well, I think um, you and I will both have to wait until the, you know, this is who we recruited to take the exam. The exam was given in the fall. No one from this exam has yet to be hired. 
So beginning with next year's testimony or uh, next the, year, the following year, as we start hiring from this list, because that's how the system works. So there, is the, so there's no beef. These people are, are still candidates. They were, they were not yet hired. So what, are, what we're encouraged by is this great number of people who have taken the exam, which will translate into a similar number of people being hired, and there's so you, the beef. So you're telling me that we're still at the same level, no beef? Well, a little so bit. So what you have done to increase the number? I mean, the, how many, exam how many minority has been higher under your administration? Well, as we can see, since 2012, and this was from the recruitment efforts of the previous administration, the um, people of color hired were about 44 percent. But we believe by those numbers that our recruitment efforts, which were extraordinary, will result in a large number from this exam. But I can't show you that yet because we haven't hired them yet. Right. So next and we year, can't. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll call upon Council Member Cabrera. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations. Uh, it's good to be back. I, looking around, I think I'm the only uh, council member who was in this committee uh, the last four years coming back. So thank the speaker for that opportunity and welcome all the new members. Uh, I have a couple of questions here. Number one, do you have, do you survey uh, your minority um, FDNY members uh, so we could know their sentiments, their struggles, how do they deal with the present culture of the FDNY? There is a survey that's taken when people leave Proby School, and right now there is a uh, underway a, a survey being designed that will be given to members of this department, a climate survey. So we have not done that in the past of members beyond um, their graduation for probationary firefighter school, but one will be done uh, in 2018. I'm just curious, Commissioner, why haven't we done one the last four years in light of all the lawsuits, in light of okay. uh, the law numbers that we had? I just, I mean, didn't anybody think about this four years ago? We do an, a survey as part of our diversity and inclusion training, and we have a portion of it. And so for our training, we do that almost every single day of the year. We're meeting with firefighters, EMTs, prevention, as well as civilians in our department. And as part of that training process, we ask them, what should the department start doing? What should it stop doing? And what should it continue doing? And we encourage a very robust conversation about what they would like to see take place. One of the things that the commissioner has made clear is that he wants diversity and inclusion to be an integral part of the department's core values. And that every bureau and unit is accountable for that. And so we take that feedback and we talk to the leadership of the department and we invite new initiatives so that we can make sure that we listen to what is being said and hold ourselves accountable for bringing the necessary change about. So can you share with us what were the results and how long have you been gathering this data? So we've been gathering this data for the last two years. Uh, that's how long we have been doing this type of training and the amount of feedback that we get back, it's, it's for every particular bureau and unit. I can't share with you the specifics of what that data is at this moment because it's a, it's a huge amount of data. But we but do I, I'm sh you know, the whole idea of gathering data is not just to gather data, it's to gather and then interpret that data and then so you could come out with a plan and then execute uh, and to make the changes. So can you share with us what were the findings, the overall findings, and as a result of that, uh, what policy changes have taken place? So that's, it's not that 
much of a simplistic process as just giving a broad overview is something that we meet with our leadership about so that we can discuss all of those different things that come up in those meetings and so that we can do what's necessary to bring about new initiatives and changes in policy for the department is something that we are still looking at and still working with so perhaps in the future we'll be able to provide you with something more comprehensive. I have to tell you after two years uh, you should have some definite uh, numbers and uh, variables uh, to bring here and you're already saying that you're already looking at, you're discussing. In order to discuss something, that means you have some definite answers that the discussion is taking place. So I mean, the answer to me seems a bit nebulous, to be honest with you. Uh, and I will hope next time that we gather here together that you could come back uh, with the results of the survey. Because it's been two years, and you're talking about it. You're having a meeting with the upper echelon. Uh, therefore, it tells me that, you know, you're doing something with it and you, you, you got to know something. So uh, if you could bring that, uh, Commissioner, next time, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, second question I had was in terms of how many, how many Latinos and African American and Asians are in leadership right now in your department? Um. How would how do we, we define leadership? Well, how do you define leadership? How would I define leadership? Yes. Well, there's different levels of leadership, certainly. Um, the so leadership, I you see the civilian leadership of the job, uh, as the speaker said, that I have more control over, which is outside the civil service system, I would say is uh, extremely diverse in terms of people of color and women. Uniformed within the firefighter ranks, um, it's lagging behind the hiring. So therefore, there is work, there will be work to be done as we bring people in, in order to um, move, that they move up in the department in similar numbers to the numbers of people coming in. Do you right have any now, numbers before us? Do we have the numbers? Yes, we do. Thank you. We can, we can provide that to you. Okay, thank you. Do, do you mind sharing them right now? Um, yeah, I can do that. Thank we you. Have um, let's see. I think it would be easier to to do it later as it's laid out. We have 44 company officers. And how many officers are overall in your department? Male and his no male and his Hispanic male, black and Hispanic officers are 154 out of about 2,000. Out of 2,000, so we're talking about 5%? Women officers are 7 out of 64. Uh, out of 64 women, 7 of them are officers. And the reason for that is because? Mainly because the bulk of the um, firefighters hired who are people of color have been hired in the last cycle of 3,000 people and have not yet qualified to take promotional exams. I would say that's the main reason. There are certainly uh, uh, secondary and tertiary reasons for, the, for that lag. Have you seen uh, an uptick on um, your membership coming up? Uh, that are there right now applying that who are eligible? I think it's too early yet, you know, as far as Looking at the numbers of people who are eligible and extrapolating that, we'd have to get those numbers to you. I do not have those. Okay, just two, qu two more quick questions here. Uh, one is, there was a comment made before that 0.6, when we have woman uh, firefighter, uh, that it's a hard number to move. But what I learned, when you have a, such a small number, it's actually easier to move that number. Uh, and I, I'm looking at the LA numbers. Um, their department, I think if I saw it was 4%. Uh, why had they been more successful in uh, not only in recruiting and uh, being able to have more women in, in their department? 
Um, so we've met with LA uh, actually quite extensively, and actually they've looked to us for recruitment advice. Um, you know, one of the reasons you see the difference in number is a difference in size. We're more than twice as large as LA. LA's fire department. Um, so while their percentage is higher, they don't necessarily have more female firefighters than we do. Um, and so we've actually tried to work collaborati collaboratively with them to figure out um, what things have worked and what things have not. Um, and we continue to do that together. Um, as the commissioner has said, you know, we're, we're very constrained by civil service. We have to take who's on a list we already have. And so a lot of what we've done is forward looking. It's looking at how to get more women on the next list. Um, which we did more than double the number of women on this next list. But they used a CPAT exam. Does that all, make a difference? All, um, all large departments nationwide use the CPAT, as do we. Do we use CPAT yeah, we as do. a test? But we have our own internal? Uh, there are tests once you're in the academy, but there's only one physical test to get onto the job, and that's the CPAT, and all large departments use that test. Okay. Uh, let me close with this. Commission, I should have started with this, so I'll leave the best uh, for last. Thank you for all you're doing. We're moving in the right direction. I, I've seen significant changes uh, from the last four years when I first uh, I started in this committee. So I commend you for that. I commend you for all the work, for your leadership that is taking place. Let's keep moving in that direction and Absolutely. putting more resources. And I'm glad to I see that we're adding another $100,000 uh, in terms of recruitment. I think that's what I read. Uh, in our briefing notes. Uh, so again, I commend you and, uh, and, and the brave men of, of the FDNY. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much. And finally, uh, Council Member Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Congratulations. I'm uh, honored to be part of this committee. Um, Commissioner, the, um, the effort to diversify the ranks and, and, and having a CDIO, is that, is that peerless to New York? Are we the only ones that have that? LA or Phoenix or Chicago, is anyone doing that too? Uh, I believe, well, C the role of CDIO has expanded throughout, you know, academia, through business, and through departments. I, I don't know if uh, other departments have someone who fills that role. They might, some of them have people who do that as part of their task. I don't know if they have someone who specifically, who's that, their only job is the CDIO. Yeah, most of the other departments I've met with, because they're so much smaller, they usually have people doing, um, you know, one person might be doing the jobs of the three or four of us up sure. here. Um, but I'd say most other large departments are at least looking at the issue of diversity in the same way we are. And was your, was the FDNY's effort to diversify its ranks based on any other model, like PD's model or? We have worked with uh, NYPD, uh, sanitation, corrections, the military, uh, all the other large departments in the country, um, and some experts in sort of diversity and inclusion work. So all of those we've tried to draw from um, and at least apply them where we can at the fire department. And last question. Um, as far as attrition with, with folks retiring, is there an idea, do you have a handle on the percentage of folks that are taking their place that are women or people of color or maintaining women or people of color? You know, tra traditionally in our department, um, folks worked 27 or 28 years prior to retirement. There was a bit of a, a, a glitch, a blip after 9-11 in which we lost uh, quite a significant number of members of the department to retirement. Um, now we've hired, there was a, also a break in which the department couldn't hire while this case was uh, being settled by the federal courts. So in the past three years, um, we've hired 3,000 people to fill the ranks of the department. So I think we're back down to a number of, of um, approximately 600 people a year retiring, uh, looking forward, and that would meet more the traditional model within the department. Right. I think one of the things that's great about this city is that it is a what have you done for me lately kind of city, but I give you guys credit for turning and facing this issue and uh, working in the right direction, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just a few more questions, and then we will uh, have our next panel. Um, can you just talk about the, the funding over the past uh, couple of years that uh, has been increased for minority and, and people of color and women recruitment? How has it gone up over the past couple of budgets? Is, is your goal to have more? Can you use more, et cetera? 
Uh, so it was $10 million for this last campaign. I'm not actually sure what it was before that. Nafisa may uh, want to answer that. But I would say for future campaigns, one of the things we're doing right now is looking at, now that we've given the test and, and completed this recruitment cycle, we're doing a cost-benefit analysis of that cycle. Um, I don't think the goal would necessarily to be spe to spend more or less. It'd be to spend where it showed to have the best results in the next campaign. So we're currently undergoing that effort right now um, as looking at the budget. And uh, how much staff uh, is dedicated to uh, recruitment efforts in the uh, department? So there's a full-time staff in recruitment that is there, um, you know, every year, which is I think about 15 or 20 people. But during recruitment cycles when the test is about to be given, um, hundreds of uniform members come and do overtime with the unit. So sort of in terms of the whole department, it's quite large, but that ebbs and flows with the test. I think in this, in this previous cycle, we used 1,000 people in the department yeah. uh, overall uh, as recruiters. And, and so over time, over the past six fiscal years for recruitment was $23 million. That's primarily because the people we're using to recruit candidates are they're firefighters themselves and they're on light duty or they're doing it as a function of overtime or? They're doing it, um, most of them part-time on overtime. Most of that n thousand number, yes. Is, I mean, have you looked at whether that's a, a, a good way to spend money? I mean, is, is it, would it be better to have certain people just assigned full-time to recruitment? That is one of the things that's in the after action is whether or not um, offline details um, versus part-time overtime details would be better. So it's one of the things we're looking at. I, mean, I, I guess to be frank, you know, if you're getting two firefighters who are just happy to make some overtime, you know, what is the, is there a goal for them? Or do they get a pat on the back or if they No, so there's a, a pretty, I'd say intensive um, quality assurance role. We have a number of officers who come to the unit and help with that, and um, Commissioner Noonan can expand on that, but we do look at that pretty closely. Mm -hmm. It's definitely more important to not just look at the overtime, um, and being cautious about having more details to the unit means that you burn out the recruiter. So having fresh blood coming into the unit, having them go out energetic and recruit new people um, every day, is something that we look at. Uh, we do notice that the members that are detailed to the unit, sometimes it can be a little bit mundane to go for an entire year recruiting at that level every single day. So we do encourage the fresh blood, which is why we trained over a thousand recruiters to help us out with this past campaign. And um, your vision, uh, Assistant Commissioner, going forward, um, are you prepared to give us a plan of the direction you'd like the recruitment office to go in b before the budget hearing next month? Yeah, we've been working pretty uh, tirelessly on an after action plan based on the last campaign. Um, a lot of the, uh, res the results of the after action will look at where people score. So there's a piece that we're missing at this point. Um, but there's a lot of data to look at, you know, you know, not only just the field campaign, it's a lot of what we did within the social media uh, front of it, which was something new to the department. Uh, so we have a lot of different fronts to look at and to analyze um, based on the budget and um, how successful each type of recruitment was. Have we identified any things that we've done in the, in the, 27, in the, the advance of the 2017 test that just haven't worked? We're still analyzing. For me to say it right now without having the final report would, would be an advance, so I would rather wait until we're done. Okay. And then just uh, the final question I have is the... Uh, the department testified at uh, a hearing, I think, two years ago that the percentage of firehouses uh, equipped to accommodate female firefighters was 80 percent. Uh, what is the current percentage and uh, what's the plan for the rest? Uh, right now it's 100 percent. Okay. But the department is also planning to make improvements on um, areas, dressing areas or transitional areas, and there is money budgeted towards that, um, and that's work is ongoing. But there are now uh, every firehouse is uh, suitable. So there's no uh, prohibition from any female to being relocated at any firehouse for for that reason. Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Uh, the next panel we'll be calling is uh, Owen Barzali, and uh, I see some of his members 
from local 2507. So hello, guys and gals. Uh, and also Yetta Kurland from uh, EMS Women. We have to wait for Brian. I don't know the oath by heart, so. Oh, okay. We're not going to swear you in. Okay. All right. So I guess uh, we will begin with uh, with uh, Owen. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Borelli and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today with regards to the issue of diversity within the FDNY. Diversity is not just about, about numbers. It is about ensuring respect, recognition, and equal treatment within the ranks. The bias that hinders diversity on the fire side of the department also adversely impacts our members who serve on the EMS side of the department. While the department, and Commissioner Nigro specifically, has made strides to improve diversity, our members are predominantly minorities, and we have a significant numbers of women. While this may seem like an improvement, unfortunately despite this, or maybe because of this, EMS workers are severely underpaid, earning a fraction of what other emergency workers earn, are often disciplined at a higher ratio compared to the fireside, causing penalties being levied on them that include withholding pay. For employees who are already significantly underpaid, this can be devastating. On top of this, the EMS side of the fire department is not always given the resources, attention, and recognition it deserves. EMS workers handle a good majority of the calls that come into the fire department. They put their lives on the line protecting New Yorkers in the most dangerous situations that face the city from responding to hazardous material incidents, active shooters, and terrorist attacks. Yet too often the department forgets to recognize these contributions and the, and the sacrifices we make. I hope the work of this committee will result in encouraging the department to see the value of the EMS side of the department so that the work can begin in ensuring that not only EMS, not only is the FDNY diverse, but the diversity is embraced within the same dignity and respect as all other members of the FDNY, and given the same equal opportunity which they have earned and deserve to thrive within the department. I look forward to the chance to work with this committee and the department to remedy these problems and build the strongest possible FDNY for New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Now, do, do you have a statement on behalf of Mr. Verialli? I do. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I apologize. That's okay. Uh, good, good morning. My name is Yetta Kurland from the Kurland Group. I represent both Local 2507 as well as Local 3621, um, which make up the EMS um, officers and members. Uh, Mr. Verialli, the president of Local 3621, couldn't be here today, so he asked me to read a prepared statement. He wanted to show his respect uh, and and uh, uh, appear here today. Uh, dear Chairperson Borelli and committee members of the Fire and Emergency Management Committee, thank you for holding this hearing and for helping to bring attention to the challenges the FDNY faces with regards to diversity. We are committed to eliminating the bias which can lead to issues with diverse representation within the department, but also we are committed to working within the department to ensure that there is a fair uh, treatment and promotional process and equal employment for all members currently within the department. We must improve the department's message to minorities and women. We can begin by improving the message to the emergency medical service members by recognizing them as uniformed officers. The EMS is the most diverse group within the FDNY. We need to have these members feeling respected, 
so then they will bring back a message to their respective communities that others who join the department will also be treated equally. In the absence of this commitment, in the absence of this, others who join the department will just perpetuate a perception that the FDNY is not welcoming to diverse members. <clears throat> Instead, we want to send a message that the department embraces diversity and will work to represent with equality those members. This can begin by providing a civil service career ladder that helps eliminate the implicit and explicit bias that currently occurs in the promotional processes that happen now. This could be a step towards ensuring equal and fair treatment to the AMS workforce so that they are treated the same as other uniformed emergency service members both within the department and throughout the city. As long as there is a negative image of the fire department and as long as there is unfair treatment within its ranks, we will continue to diminish the department and hurt New Yorkers who rely on us. I very much look forward to providing this committee and the department with extensive examples and constructive paths forward to help remedy these challenges. I thank you for the time and commitment to this issue and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So I'm sorry, I only have two cards here. Can, can you state your name? Yes, hi, I'm Michael Greco, Vice President of Local 2507. Nice to meet you, Mike. You, nice to meet you. I didn't fill the card. I didn't plan on speaking, um, but a couple of things came up that in case it comes back up, I'd like to address. Specifically, the promotion from EMS to fire uh, is something I would like to address you guys, if, if allowed. Um, you guys brought it up as a path to increase diversity on the fire side. Um, what I'd like to make sure you guys know is that to me is a three card Monty game of just moving your diversity resources. It severely hinders our service, this promotion. Um, medical profession is an experience game. So when you have paramedics and EMTs out there who are serving the citizens of New York, you want them experienced. By devastating our ranks every four or five months, you're taking the experience away and you're calling it a promotion, which for the most basic way I can put it is an insult to a paramedic and an EMT. Um, a paramedic trains if they go straight 40 hours a week for nine months to become a paramedic to treat the citizens of New York. EMTs do that for three months. Um, a firefighter training is three months. A paramedic gives up his patch, takes it off of his shoulder and puts it on the ground to get what's called a CFR, Certified First Responder, which is about an 80-hour course that you can do. And it's called a promotion. Why do they do that? Because it's about $50,000 more a year. Um, so we have a lot of our members who want to treat the citizens of New York, but they're told by their family, by others, give it up, you, you can make much more money. So we bring up the numbers, 30% uh, female, 51 plus non-white, that is a form of diversity problem. It's not just numbers, it's how you treat our members, how you treat our service. So that's where we just, I, I really wanted to address that promotion opportunity. Thank you for your time. Uh, th thank you, Vice President Greco, and thank you to the whole panel. I, I just have one question, and I know Council Member Cabrera has a question. Um, the, the turnover rate uh, from people who leave the EMT job do you have a rough idea what's the percentage that go on to an EMT officer program and paramedic versus what's the percentage of people who just leave the job to explore a different career? Just as estimates. Our retention rate is extremely high. Just uh, last month, I'm sorry, in December, they took 10% of our workforce to go over to the fire side. So that was devastating to our lines. Uh, like uh, Mr. Greco mentioned, uh, we're taking experienced people from our side to go to the other side. Uh, as far as uh, other uh, positions within the city, uh, we're losing people left and right, whether it's to MTA, NYPD, sanitation. Um, we're, we are a revolving door for other opportunities, opportunities within the city. And if I could just follow up and maybe weave in what both uh, uh, the president and vice president have said, I think if we could focus on two issues, and I know this will be a process and the committee will look at a lot of different issues, but I think um, speaking from the EMS side, um, 
we need to really think about how the promotional process happens in a way that is um, investing in and developing the EMS and the fire department as a whole, both for diversity purposes and for retention purposes. And the second issue is I think we need to look at pay inequities that are happening. The rate of pay on the EMS side is just, um, it's below the, the poverty lines in New York City, an EMS worker working overtime, um, 10, 12 years on the job could still be making in the 40s uh, in terms of overall salary with overtime. So I think if we could focus in on those two areas, we'd make great strides. Um, and I think it also adds to the idea of um, the sense of respect. We talk about bringing in diversity and then how do we treat that diversity once they are amongst the ranks. And if we really want to create an idea um, where the FDNY is seen as uh, embracing diversity and recruiting diversity, we have to treat those diverse members well once they come in within the ranks. Uh, thank you, Councilman Cumbrera. Can I, can I just add oh, one, sorry. one yes, point? Please. On the EMS side, as far as uh, promotional to other ranks, other than a lieutenant, everything else is non-civil service. Mm -hmm. So there's, the, there's no opportunities other than um, and, and in your experience, what leads to promotion beyond lieutenant? You seem like you have an answer yet. That, that is a big topic. <laughs> that, that is a big uh, concern that we, we're trying to legislate as we speak to have it as a civil service because otherwise it's who you know. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's who you know. Currently, there's an internal uh, process, and this is also a, a place that, that 3621 is, is in the process of litigating, um, there is an internal process uh, that we would call nothing more really than an interview. Um, that lends itself to subjectivity and, and at the least implicit bias. There really needs to be a formalized process. What 3621 is looking to do is create the civil service protections um, that would both address the concerns with diversity and bias in that promotion and just also um, make those positions more stabilized. Um, so that's what we're looking to do, and there really is a lot we could talk about in terms of how that testing works exactly, um, but it is very limited. It is still within just the FDNY. There's no oversight with DCAS as you would see with civil service exams. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Cabrera? Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's truly a shame what they're doing to you uh, in terms of this inequality of pay. Uh, it sends a message that you're not being valued uh, in your work. Uh, I just want to be clear that if I heard right, the, the max pay is 44000 It's 47000 for EMTs and about 60000 for paramedics. That's the max? That's the maximum. Wow. That's shocking. It truly is. And I can see why you, you're losing members who want to stay, yeah. who love their job, which anybody who studies uh, 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 careers or taught a course in this uh, subject matter will tell you that people are leaving because of the pay, not because of what they love. So when they go to the next job, uh, they're not going to do it with the same love. Uh, there's something about when people work with passion, they give more attention uh, to precision, uh, to excellence. And so, uh, I, I mean, Mr. Chairman, I, I hope uh, that we could work together in, in helping them uh, to making this a reality. I, the one question I had was in regards to what the commissioner said uh, regarding the reason why uh, some minorities uh, were dropping out was because they, didn't, they weren't waiting long enough, therefore they didn't want it bad enough. Do you, do you buy into that argument? Uh, civil service laws are very complex. So sometimes it is a lengthy process. Uh, if an opportunity comes to somebody before the FDNY, some people may take it. If NYPD screened them quicker than FDNY, then they'll may jump on that. Uh, so shouldn't it be the same ratio with Caucasians as it is with minorities? Why is not minorities higher, a higher number? It should be proportionate, right? It should be proportionate. And why? That, that, but, that struck me odd. 
this issue is not being addressed by this administrator. Uh, with all respect to Mr. Nigro, the, the commissioner of our department, he is in, in favor of this. Mm. What happened previously is, um, is why we're, fit, we're here today. I, also, I would just add to that, I think we have to be really careful about blaming employees from problems with attrition and recruitment from employers. That just puts us down a very dangerous, slippery slope. I actually think, and again, we are positively engaging with the department. We want to work with them in a partnership to solve this problem. We do recognize some of the steps that have been made by the department at the same time. What I uh, was struck with when the commissioner was speaking was that he referred to the fireside um, as the uniformed service members and referred to the EMS side as civilians. Mm. And that is really a punch in the stomach um, to those brave men and women. I think it undermines what some of these problems are. When we think about that type of exclusionary mentality, we then understand that a predominantly white male fireside, that's the uniform service, is much higher paid, which God bless, we wouldn't want, we want them to be well compensated, but then you look at the predominantly of color, larger female base of EMS workers, we're not recognizing them as uniform service. When it serves us to do so, we hold them to that standard, uh, but then we don't reward them as such. I think we have to change that mentality. Uh, well said, and if you had a mic, you could have dropped at this point. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, uh, no more questions for you guys. Oh, I, you may, if I just may add. Sure. By the end of this year, we're going to lose 30% of our members wow. going to the other side. And what, what is the cost to retrain? Uh, what, what is the cost to, to train a new uh, EMT hire? It's two to three months in our academy. Um, the average stay here is two years, two, three years. So that we're wasting all this money on training new hirees that want to stay here, but they're only leaving because of the compensation. Sure. So we're wasting more money on, tra on constantly training people instead of making a commitment to a job that they want. And losing the experience. Correct. It, uh, there's studies showing that experience impact the results of patient care. When I have my heart attack, I hope a very experienced EMT comes. I'll be the first to admit that. Yeah, yeah. But thank you very much, folks. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Regina Wilson, president of the Vulcan Society, Paul Washington, and Khalid Baylor. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, would you prefer to start, Ms. Wilson? Thank you. Oh, there it is. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning to all the council members in attendance here today, all interested parties and guests. Thank you for allowing me to speak today to the issue of diversity in FDNY. My name is Regina Wilson, and I'm the president of the Volk Society of New York. Throughout the history of the FDNY, diversity and inclusion has always been an issue which the Fire Department of New York has seemed to have a hard time getting resolved. <clears throat> if you simply look at the very visible percentage of people of color and women throughout the fire service, it's 150 plus years. It tells the story of true, uh, of, uh, it tells the story of true commitment, untrue commitment to diversity in the fire service. African Americans represent only 8% of suppression on the suppression side of the FDNY. Women represent less than 1%. Hispanics, 10%. Asian and Native Americans are also less than 1%. Unfortunately, all changes to diversifying the FDNY did not come with the willingness, views of, or of the future to make the FDNY the best fire department in the world due to a diverse workforce on the suppression side of the department or the possible opportunities for the community 
It was due to several lawsuits from the Vogue Society fighting for people of color and women, and the lawsuit from Captain Brenda Berkman for equality and fair hiring practices for women to join the fire service. The path of resistance has been met for many years. I believe we are, we are, it is still being met with that resistance today. The FDNY just completed a recruitment drive for the position of firefighter. Although we have recruited a large amount of women and people of color, this is still not enough, and the department still has not reached a court settlement number of outreach to people of color and test takers. In the recruitment process, there were poor, poorly trained recruiters and uh, little to non-retraining for recruiters who have poor performance skills. I believe this inability to consistently monitor recruiters and their work performance and ethics caused critical errors in our recruitment drive. These critical, these errors, errors of, errors of address may have yielded the numbers, I'm sorry. These errors addressed may have yielded the numbers needed to have critical, to have the critical numbers given to the city that will represent the, the percentage of African Americans in the city. Although the FDNY has yielded high numbers from the latest recruitment campaign, if the department in any way does not continue to commit to a high level of diversity, the suppression side of the department in the ongoing years and fix some of its critical errors, this department will never reach its full potential greatness, nor will it ever truly represent the city it serves. The other alarming issue resolving diversity the in the department and the FDNY's lack of preparedness for the increased number of women and people of color entering the department and the firehouse. The message of inclusiveness in, in the department, tr true vision and support of diversity and inclusion is not done on a consistent basis. The FDNY historically has done nothing in its power to oppose the to. Uh, Nothing in its power to oppose the inclusion of women and people of color by the means of harassment, segregation, violence, and unfair hiring practices. The traditions and culture of the department, which in some firehouses are still practiced today, is that anyone who is non-white, male or female, is not welcome. It is more critical than ever before that on all levels of the department to understand that diversity, inclusion, and equal treatment are the core values of the department. Without this message, not only being said in the form of electric and print messaging, you have to hold people accountable when they do not commit to the values of the department or the officers of the FDNY, do not provide the atmosphere in the firehouse that holds those values as well. Because of the seriousness of this matter is not addressed or upheld properly by the department, now more than ever, members of the organization and other people of color are being harassed and treated unfairly in the firehouses by the fire department as well as firefighters. Firefighters have been subjected to discrimination of race and religion, gender biases, disability, and consistent abuse, and I will also add sexual abuse. I have attached some examples of such actions. When these actions are performed, the department at times have a delay or non-reaction to these cases and they do not give the message that the bad actors does not represent the department in any way and that these actors will never be tolerated in the department. This is never a consistent message from the department because it is not expressed to the members on a consistent basis. The message is viewed as a, as a passing phase. More often the department is dealing with the problem or has taken some sort of action. The issue in the firehouse are not addressed to the firehouse directly of the wrong committed or why the action taken by the department, if any, were necessary. If the department does not take a more deliberate action in truly valuing the greatness that a diverse workforce can bring to the department and the citizens in which they serve, we will never be the greatest fire department in the world. Every citizen applying should not fear not being accepted because of color of their skin, gender, religion, belief, or disabilities. The fire department still has a lot of work to do and we don't have time to wait. I would also like to uh, read to you a statement made by the president of the United Women Firefighters, if I can. Sure. Thank you. Could, could you also email that to, to the committee? so we? Yes, could, I will. She you. sent it to me this morning, I'm Thank sorry, you. sir. Okay, my name is Serena Sarissa Cole and I'm the president of the United Women Firefighters. We represent the women's firefighters and officers of the FDNY in New York City. Currently, there are 67 of us serving in the department, which is a historic, a hist historic high. However, the force is nearly 11,000 members large, making our percentage of 0.6% the worst gender disparity out of all major departments in the United States. By comparison, the national average is around 4%. 
Women and cities such women in, in cities such as Minneapolis, San Francisco, and Seattle are in the double digits. Although changes in the fire department, in the fire recruitment and hiring processes help increase our numbers from 41 back in 1982 to the number of 67 women that have been hired since 2013. More major changes need to occur to achieve gender parity within the fire department. One of our organization's main interests is to fill the gaps left behind by the fire department in recruiting efforts as it relates to young women. For last year's campaign, we helped create two commercials featuring women firefighters and, and aimed at young women. The fire department did not show the media we created and even met us with hostility when creating the portion where women firefighters wore uniforms. We were we also created our own women's focus events and have been consistently met with amenity, amnesty sorry, and uh, roadblocks by the FDNY. Last year's campaign was the first time in recent recruitment campaigns where there was very little collaboration between the FDNY and the United Women Firefighters. The age maximum for non-military vet applications for the FDNY test is 28 years old. No other major department has such a low age cap. Most departments have no age limit, and when they do, it is usually 35 years old. <coughs> Since this low age limit consists of childbearing years and women entering non-traditional fields at older age, we believe this rule is gender discrimination. Additionally, the hiring tempo of once every four years severely limits the chances an individual gets to take this exam in their lifetime. The workplace in firehouses severely needs to improve to be at a place of professionalism and equality equality. There are too many instances of women firefighters and other firefighters of diverse background getting hazed and bullied just because they're different. New stories of horrible incidents consistently crop up in, in, and deter well-meaning women and forward-thinking New Yorkers from joining the force. These issues outlined are many but, the tips, but are tips of the iceberg. Many other cities in the United States and abroad have been able to successfully increase their numbers of women firefighters, and we hope that a city as progressive as New York can one day do the same. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Washington, Mr. Baylor, uh, do you have prepared statements? I, yes. Thank you. Yes, I do. Um, thank you for, uh, uh, for having us at this, uh, at this uh, hearing. I'm glad to be able to give uh, some brief testimony. Um, my name is Paul Washington. And uh, I'm a past president of the Vulcan Society and a captain in the fire department, and I've got almost 30 years on the job. And I'm very proud to say that um, it was the actions um, under my administration that brought this, uh, this lawsuit that we're, uh, the fire department is currently uh, under. Um, I feel very strongly that despite the improving numbers of firefighters in the FDNY who are black and people of color, this administration receives a failing grade when it comes to its relationship uh, with black firefighters. And I want to use three. Uh, I want to use three quick examples, uh, personal examples that show um, uh, that illustrate uh, what I'm talking about. There was a, uh, a recent, a uh, few months ago, there was an article in the Post. It was a front page article um, featuring myself that um, uh, that denigrated me, made me look bad. Uh, they took some words I said out of context about firefighters uh, not running into burning buildings. Um, there was a video of me speaking to uh, some college students at the time where I said this. And if anyone watched the video, which is readily available on YouTube, they would clearly understand what I meant. And what I meant was if the whole building's on fire, we don't run in. We don't run through flames. And that was clearly, uh, uh, that, was, that was clear from the, uh, from the video. Um, at the last memorial service in October, Commissioner Nigro took the opportunity, took that opportunity to bond with the white firefighters in New York City by saying, yes, we do run into burning buildings. He said it several times, and it was clear what he was going for. It was a dog whistle, loud and clear, uh, to the white firefighters saying, yeah, you know, we're bonding, I'm bonding with you against this uppity black man who had the nerve to bring a lawsuit and fight for diversity into the, into the, the fire department. That was clear. And that message, that message was... It, I'm sure he would say that, no, that's not what he was doing, but that message was received loud and clear. Um, and that message is just a message of separation because black firefighters heard something different. Black firefighters uh, heard a different message, and the message they heard was, yeah, we're going to put this black guy in his place, and it's two separate departments. There's a black, you know, we, we're going to act one way towards a, a black man who's speaking out, 
and, uh, and another way towards others. So that, that's one illustration. Another illustration is um, uh, my particular firehouse. In my firehouse, we have uh, a large number of people of color, um, relatively speaking. Um, uh, and, 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 and there, but there are other black firefighters that want to come into my firehouse. These firefighters are not allowed to come into my firehouse. They're kept, off, they, they're kept out of my firehouse uh, by various means. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's more of a trickle than, uh, of, of, of black firefighters coming in than, than it should be. Um, there are black firefighters who are looking to be detailed into my firehouse. Um, two in particular um, that have been, that have suffered egregiously in the fire department. There are two black firefighters who suffered egregiously. I don't want to say their names, but um, uh, in their firehouse. And they want to leave those firehouses and come to my firehouse. And, uh, uh, and they're not being allowed to. They want to come there on a, on a temporary basis. They're not being allowed to by this administration. Now, you might think that there are some various reasons as to why they're not being allowed to come in, but when you, um, uh, when you hear what the chief of department, uh, Chief Leonard, said in a meeting about two years ago uh, with our president, with President Wilson, he said at that time that he didn't want at that time, there were black firefighters who were trying to come into my uh, fire company. He says, no, we don't want them to come in because we don't want to make uh, a, a black fire company or a black fire house. Um, he says it had been done in the past and it didn't work out, and that's not true. There's never been a, uh, there's never been a predominantly black company or firehouse in the city of New York um, uh, before my company. Um, uh, and, and, and that there was a company that had... Um, uh, uh, more blacks in it than uh, uh, than other companies, but there were no problems there. It was a it was a very good experience from all of the in talking to all of the firefighters who uh, who, uh, who were there. Um, but not only not only that, but he also said that he didn't want to make white firefighters uncomfortable. He didn't want white firefighters to be uncomfortable because there's a lot of blacks in a particular firehouse. Now, when you say that. You know, you're sending a clear message that we're going to treat black firefighters who are trying to get into this into this uh, into this company a little bit differently. Why aren't they going to be? And they're not going to be allowed to come in because we don't want white firefighters to feel uncomfortable. I mean, every firehouse in the city of New York for 150 years has been predominantly white. Uh, do those black fire so those black firefighters feel uncomfortable because they're in the same position that Chief Lennon doesn't want the white firefighters to be in? There's nothing wrong with that, or that's okay, and we can have that, but we can't have the white firefighters feeling uncomfortable. And there's no, uh, and, and I don't believe that that would be the case, that the white firefighters would feel uncomfortable. But that shows you where this administration is coming from in terms of uh, uh, firefighters coming to my house, another illustration. And the last thing I want to say is um, uh, I joined this department in 1988. I uh, became a member of the Vulcan Society Executive Board in 1990. And um, the president at that time uh, was nice enough to take me under his wing and bring me to uh, various meetings with commissioners and so on. So I've met with every commissioner since Commissioner Safer in the early 90s. Commissioner Safer, Commissioner Rivera, Commissioner Von Essen, Commissioner Scapetta, Commissioner Cassano, and Commissioner Nigro. And I can say uh, without any, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, they've all acted the same way. They've all acted the same way. They're never proactive in, 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 uh, uh, in taking action that uh, black firefighters need. And when we come to them with suggestions, this is, what we, this is what we think you should do in this area, this is what we think you should do in that area, it's always like, well, we'll see what we can do or we'll look into that, but nothing gets done. This administration is no different from the others. The only difference is a federal judge is overseeing them. Everything that they've done, uh, has been done because the federal judge is overseeing them. They, they spoke about a CDIO and a diversity advocate. They never mentioned they were hired because they had to be hired because of the lawsuit. They didn't do that on their own. They had to hire a CDIO. They had to hire a diversity advocate. The recruitment effort that they, that they had to do, they, they, were, they were forced into doing that. The judge said he wanted 28% of the people who applied to take the test to be black. The fire department didn't reach that number, but the reason that they put in the effort was because they had to. Um, so those are just some of the things that, uh, that I wanted to mention, and, um, uh, and that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Good afternoon. Um, I don't have a prepared statement. Uh, I would like to forward it at a, a later time. 
Uh, but in, in reference to the topic of recruitment, diversity, and, and change on the job, I don't know exactly where to start. Uh, I first got my application with the, for the New York City Fire Department through the Vulcan Society uh, back in 1999 at a, I would say, uh, African Day Parade in Harlem. At that time, I worked my tail off vigorously to, to be a part of the department and then getting hired and sworn in on 2000, in 2003, I was placed at uh, the fire academy and then soon after a firehouse within East Harlem. When I got there, I was exposed to a culture that was indifferent than what I was normal to. Uh, seeing uh, different things such as you know, racist slurs uh, talk, said to me, uh, because of my name is an is a, a Arabic name, I was thought to be a terrorist. You know, one gentleman even said that my first day at the firehouse, he said, why would headquarters send us a Muslim name individual when we lost guys at 9-11? He said, all we can know is that this guy could be a secret cell terrorist. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. You know, I worked at uh, the World Trade Center. I was a chef there at one time. I lost people at, at, at Windows in the World. I also had family members who were military that served in the armed forces for this great, great, great uh, United States. And I just thought that that was just wrong. And this was said in the company of officers and other members of the firehouse. That individual now is, is within the ranks of a management of a lieutenant now serving at a firehouse in Harlem. I wanted to say that because when we come into these meetings and we talk about uh, diversity uh, and the different cultures in which that, uh, that occur at the firehouse, you oftentimes hear that the firehouses are not racist. We don't have guys there that, that, that do uh, wrongful things to individuals who are minorities. That doesn't happen. But when you look at the newspaper, we see that as different. We look at the press, we see that's different. Uh, any person that's in upper management that has time on this job cannot ever tell me that they haven't witnessed themselves or heard of themselves of any other individual who was performing something that was incorrect at the firehouse that had to do with uh, something wrong with minorities. The job I have been involved with three different campaigns of, of recruitment uh, with the fire department. I've been on the grounds working as a recruiter, uh, detailed to the recruitment unit, and working on my own time as a recruiter with the Vulcan Society. I've seen a lot of different things that have come across the table as to where we have tried to uh, make better efforts uh, and for the department to put initiatives against uh, for recruitment within our communities of color they increase minorities, they increase women on the job, and at times, at times there has been pushback. Um, at other times, I have noticed that the changes in which that the department has put forth has only come forth because of the court case. And that's incorrect. When I look at it and you say, hey, listen, I'm a New Yorker. I want to change what's going on. I want to change the firehouse. And one of the reasons in which that I got involved with the recruitment unit early on is because I saw that there was things that were going wrong. And the only way in which that you can change that is not only just having a voice, but to try to change the makeup of the firehouse. I saw that early on, and, and I still keep that going to the day. I taught the young people whenever I can see them, uh, at the supermarket, at schools, passing by, I tell them that what the benefits are of the department. Some of these individuals, they tell me, why would I join the department when I just seen something in the newspaper where a gentleman was sexually abused or where a gentleman at the firehouse was called names or uh, treated incorrectly? And then I have to try to dispel that and say, hey, listen, that, that's isolated. I still want you to take the job. I still want you to be a part of, of, of a department where you can do some good, helping people, uh, putting out fires, going to medical runs, and so forth. But we have to understand 
um, council that this change is not going to happen unless you get involved. It has to be a hands-on approach with this. It can't just be an email. It can't be a phone call. It can't just be one meeting or two. It has to be a hands-on approach. Visit the firehouse. See what's going on. And when it sees that there's an interest in your local firehouse, especially in, in communities of color, where those firehouses do not directly represent those communities in which that they service, you will get a different reaction from the department. I, I, I guarantee you that. But we, until that day comes, then we're going to have disparaging numbers. Our numbers are still going to be, as uh, the commissioner stated, it's not there yet. As the other city council person said, where's the beef? And we need that to be a state. It, it, it was uh, great for him to say that, but we have to say, where's the beef? We have to see that. The city of New York is owed something different. They have, uh, at the department right now, the firefighters have a, have a nice salary and benefits to match. But we don't have the makeup and the representation of those communities in which that we service. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh testified to something, and then you, you may have alluded to it, uh, uh, President Wilson. Um, we have the numbers to show that, that there were gains made in the number of African-American applicants and the number of folks passing the exam. And then she had alluded to that the lag between the time someone, you know, signs up to take the exam, takes the exam to finally gets hired, um, they, they've since found other jobs or, or taken, you know, different career paths. Do you agree with that, that sentiment that perhaps a shorter lag between exams or a lag between exams and hiring uh, would actually help the number of Af African-American applicants? Um, yes, I think that's absolutely true, but I also feel that they should do an attrition study. We ask for one for women because women drop off at a higher rate, and so does African Americans. We also suggested that they do things to fill in that time. I mean, it should be no reason why during this wait they're not still getting emails, getting uh, offers to come out and still have a connection with the fire department in some way, shape, or form to still generate that interest. I know for myself it took me seven years to get hired. But during that time, I had to self-motivate because during that absence of time, I didn't hear anything from the fire department. I didn't know whether or not I was still going to get hired. I had to keep calling my investigator over and over again until when they picked up the phone, they knew my voice. But not m most people would think to do that. So if the department doesn't figure out how to solve that gap or how to fix those problems, we're going to continue to have these uh, high drop-off rates, which is to the detriment of people of color and women. Okay, and then you also mentioned uh, some of the issues with the people doing the recruiting, um, and a lot of them are on overtime. And this is something I raised with them. Do you think that's the best plan? I mean, sh should there be people that are, in other words, should we find the best people to recruit and, and make them recruiters full time and have an actual, you know, uh, plan for that? Uh, I, I definitely think that they should have a full-time recruitment staff, but um, understanding that most of the firefighters that take interest in these recruitment campaigns, they are doing it whether or not they're on light duty or they'll come out and do a detail into the, to the unit for a certain amount of time. Now, most of these firefighters that do the details are full-time firefighters, so they want to get back out into the field. They do not want the, their their job to be recruitment, but they do maybe need to hire a staff that is doing that in the interim. Like right now, for instance, there's not a lot of uh, recruiting in high schools right now. They've, they've scaled back on those things, but you got to plant the seed. Like we have an, another recruitment job in another four years. You, you need to nurture that seed right now. There's no reason why you should come back on any of these recruitment drives that we've been doing, except for the offer to allow them to have a job. But they definitely 
definitely have to find a way to, to bridge those gaps. They need to find a way to make sure that the interest is still there so that we can still have viable candidates. And they also need to stop pushing back on people that are doing overtime and telling them that they can't. That was the biggest problem we had. We had to keep going to the judge and, and letting them know that the fire department and, and the members within the recruitment unit are stopping people from making overtime because they're telling them that the hours are too high. But the hours are high for the, for the senior recruiters. These are, the, these are the people that have done more than one recruitment drive that can go out and dominate and bring in those numbers instead of uh, the 9,000 people that we got um, that we had to, um, there were waivers that were given to people who were unemployed or received public assistance. They were able to get the application done for free. We had 9,000 people who they had to go back and figure out whether or not they were eligible to have it because people, some of the recruiters were signing them up right. and just saying, here, this test is free, just sign this paper. If you had educated um, senior recruiters there that were doing the job, we would never have had this problem of 9,000 people that we had to now go back and find out whether or not they were eligible. Um, can, does the Vulcan Society, or can, can any, any one of you guys and, and, and Ms. Wilson, point to a department that just does a better job? Like, is there an example out there of, of a department that's doing uh, a, a better job recruiting a, a more diverse department that's more reflective of, of the city that they serve? Um, I believe that um, I'm a part of the International Association of Black Professional Firefighters, and unfortunately, we have the same problem with discrimination against women and people of color all around this country. But unfortunately, the FDNY is the worst in any major city, meaning LA and, and Chicago and all those other major cities. Um, Chicago j just uh, had a lawsuit within themselves where they had to hire um, like 40 women onto the job because they discriminated against them. So everyone around this country is having this, you know, these diversity and, in, and um, inclusion problems. But to me, FDNY in the minds of everybody is a brand. And if this department who considers themselves great doesn't take the first step to make a difference and to show how all the other countries how to get it done, then it's, it's bad for them. I think it, it ruins their reputation as a department to be the best when they don't put their best foot forward. I think collaboratively, they could go to all these other cities and figure out what they're all doing wrong to get the best product done. But until they, they realize within themselves, even upper staff have that hard uh, conversation conversation in reference to racism, which they have a hard time dealing with till today, until they sit down and have those sexism conversations and deal with it in the board, in their, in their um, office, in their um, meeting rooms, we're never going to get this problem solved. So they could collaboratively take care of this, but it is a, it is a um, state, it's, it's all around the states. Mm -hmm. For, uh, the, the hires based on the 2012 exam um, you know, the, the, the numbers do show an increase in the number of African American and, and, and Hispanics hired. Are, are they encouraging at all? And is there a way to identify um, that, that, that your organization has actually identified as to why there were, in other words, what worked? What worked a little bit? What worked was the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. That's what no, worked. Well, the, you know, the, the lawsuit put a monitor in place, but, but what were the actual steps? that whether the department itself, or groups like the Vulcan Society, or anyone trying to recruitment, what, what caused the uptick? Well, we, we managed to get them to spend the money that they should have spent years ago. They got in a media um, agency to come in. They did grafting of the cities. They identified where the people of color were, where they could be able to do better outreach. Uh, we gave them suggestions about street teams, which were smaller groups who could go onto the community and to go to those affected areas. We were able to um, uh, um, give them the opportunity to create um, more programming on where they could possibly get more people in the future. So. Um, this, like I said, the catalyst was this lawsuit to push them forward, but a lot of these things, the electronic, the social media, all of these things could have been done a long time ago, but those are some of the reasons why. Um, being able to have a street, um, um, mobile academies which would go out into the community and take a fire truck and let them hold the hose and let them fi tr um, try on the gear, which was some of the reasons. You have to get out into the community. Far too long did red doors are closed. 
So if you do not take us of a, a, um, a active of touch and feel and let your community know that you really want them there, you're going to have a really hard time. And I think they did that more aggressively than they did in past campaigns. And, and if I may say something, it's also it's not just recruitment. Uh, it's also the written test was changed. They've got a much better test now, a test that doesn't uh, wholesale eliminate blacks like the previous uh, test that they gave. Um, the background investigations, the medical uh, investigations. For instance, um, we came to the fire department um, years ago to this administration, and we showed them that blacks going through the medical exam, you've passed all your tests, now you've got to take a medical. Blacks failed that at a rate of 30% where whites failed it at a rate of about 14%. And this is the medical exam, where they listen to your heart, your lungs, and, and things like that. The failure rate was more than twice. And we came to them, we told them, listen, this, this is a problem. Here are the statistics. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll look at it. They never even looked at it mm -hmm. until the, we had to get, then we went to the court monitor, and the court monitor had to force them to make the changes. So that's what I mean when I, when I talk about how they're not proactive mm -hmm. at all, and they push aside our concerns. But the medical exam now, because of that, has gotten better. The background investigations, um, uh, same thing. We went to them and we showed them the disparities, and they've made changes in that process that have made things better. So there's, it's, it's a lot of small factors. It's not just, it's not just recruitment. Um, uh, there are a lot of small factors, and they've improved on those because of the court monitor. The danger is when the judge leaves, mm -hmm. what's the fire department going to do? Are they going to go back to their old ways? And that has to be prevented. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, can I just uh, Certainly, yeah. um, just make a couple of statements to some of the things that I heard here today? Sure. All right. So um, as far as the, you know, they talked a lot about the diversity celebrations and some of the ways that they're trying to change the, the uh, cultures of the department or just display them. Um, in my opinion of it all, it, it, you know, that's to me is just a show. Um, and it's great to be able to celebrate different cultures, but it's, 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 it's bad when those cultures are not celebrated in the, in the firehouses. It's great to have those celebrations at headquarters, but what happens to the black firefighter that comes to work that want to celebrate uh, Afri um, uh, African American um, uh, Month, African -American Black History Month in their firehouse? They're not able to do that. They, that is not something that is uh, promoted or something that is accepted in the firehouses. So the fire department has yet to have those conversations conversations in the firehouses to let them know that diversity and inclusion is accepted. And, uh, and although the commissioner here said that that is his, his, his binding word and that's his p progressive, uh, you know, um, move right now, it does not get down to the level of the firehouses. Um, some of the, the news articles I showed you, clips are from this year and mm -hmm. last year. So it was during his administration. So far too many times we're trying to, sh to have this big lights and show about how um, we're all together and we're inclusive, but we're really not. So every day my members go to work and suffer in silence. I have to um, do EEO reports for, for uh, my members un uh, anonymously because they're afraid of retaliation they're, and they're afraid of retribution. And, it, and it's to be, uh, you know, respected by that because it happens all the time. Right now, the gentleman whose article you have, uh, Rahim Hassan, he's outside of his firehouse right now. He's not, he, he's, he didn't go back in. He's not um, uh, now being able to, uh, you know, take care of his family where he should because his, some of his money is being taken away. So all of this light and show about the diversity and inclusion and it does not trickle down to the firehouses. Also, I just want to reiterate that the UWF did go to the fire department and to Commissioner Kavanaugh and ask for a, uh, an attrition study to be done. So the UWF within, within its own... Um, and she, she did say they, they were going to do that. No, gone to, but it should have been done already. The test has already started. Oh, right. I, I was just happy <laughs> she, she committed to do it publicly. Right, but we asked her two years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, if you would have did it from the last test, we would have already had the answers for this one, and they could have been moving on it right now. So now that the test results are out, you're now trying to do a study. Like you said, there's a gap, right? There's a gap in between. Right now, you could have been working on a gap and trying to figure out why from the studies, because you did it two years ago. Mm -hmm. So none of this was, was high on their priority list. And, and, and to also let you know, the UWF did not in any way, shape, or form, very rarely, I would say, had 
any contribution in the recruitment campaign or anything that had to do with women firefighters coming on this job. Although meetings might have been had with Commissioner Kavanaugh, it produced nothing. Um, she, she promised her uh, um, um, locations to go to and, and materials so that, that the UWF can do their own um, study groups, and it was never provided. The UWF, within their own resources, provided that and helped female candidates to study to take the next exam. The UWF also does a free um, uh, physical fitness program, which is with no assistance from the fire department at all. So if they really want to try and figure out what's going on with women and also with people of color, they would listen to the UWF and they would take us more seriously. We know what we're doing. We've been on the ground for 77 years trying to do this, this job. And, 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 and um, also, just know that um, in order for it to reach 23%, it's going to take us at least another decade in order to really reflect what's going on. And I'm, and I'm tired of sitting in meetings where the commissioner stands up saying that uh, um, diversity and inclusion is important to me, but it's going to take some time. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, you know, we just got to be, be patient and, and we're going to get the work done. It's been four years. Mm -hmm. Time's up. Time's up. We got to get this done. I'm, 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 I have guys on suicide watch. I got guys going to the council unit more regularly now more than ever, and you did nothing to provide a safe haven when you know that the last class that came out was 50% people of color. You didn't even now go into the firehouses and prepare them for that uptake of women and people of color. You did nothing to change the culture and traditions of that. So now you have these people of color walking in thinking I'm getting ready to start the greatest job in the world and their spirits are being beaten down because the CDIO and the commissioner did not take responsibility to change this culture and this the fire department. You can, you can try and bring up all the percentages that you want to, but if you do not tell uh, white men that, that you're not the only skin and gender that can save and risk their lives for the community, we're never going to make progression in this department. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next panel is uh, Kristen Rouse, New York City Veterans Alliance, Dr. Darren Porcher, and Josefina Stefanelli. Latinas against FDNY cuts. I will start with you, my friend, Kristen Rouse. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Kristen Rouse. I served for more than 23 years of combined service in the United States Army, Army Reserve, and New York National Guard, including three tours of duty in Afghanistan. I am here today to testify on behalf of the New York City Veterans Alliance a member-supported grassroots policy advocacy and community building organization that advances veterans and families as civic leaders in the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, you have my prepared, uh, my prepared statement uh, to, to be briefer. Um, you know, in short, you know, the military uh, has, has uh, over many years uh, struggled to be more inclusive uh, and, and to acknowledge and, and realize and live out um, the, the truth that uh, diversity makes us stronger. Uh, diversity, you know, with teams of uh, men, women, uh, people of different racial and ethnic and national origins and uh, different gender identity, sexual orientation, you know, the full, the full spectrum of what America, of who America is. And uh, we also believe that the FDNY will find strength and diversity as it continues to, um, to make 
uh, to make progress, um, you know, based on what we've heard today. And, uh, and I appreciate everybody who's testified and uh, definitely educated me on the, the issues that the FDNY has been facing. Uh, we agree with uh, Commissioner Nigro that, um, you know, that veterans uh, are a, make great firefighters. Uh, and uh, you know EMS professionals, and uh, we're proud of the veterans and military reservists who are currently serving on the FDNY. And uh, we also believe that recruiting veterans is a way to uh, to increase um, to increase the number of women, uh, people of color, and and other uh, minority categories. Um, and uh, you know, and so we you know to that end, you know, we have a few specific recommendations. Uh, you know, we have worked with uh, the veteran recruitment team at FDNY and been happy to brainstorm with them, and we'd be glad to uh, continue that contact. Um, I have three specific recommendations uh, for for this committee um, toward recruiting veterans and increasing diversity. Um, so first, uh, the first recommendation is to provide direct credits for military education and experience. Um, you know, the United States government has gone to great expense to train men and women as team leaders, medics, engineers, military police and firefighters, and uh, in a host of leadership skills and job competencies that are direct assets to today's FDNY. Training, training transcripts, leadership evaluations, and awards are well documented in individual military records, and these official documents uh, can be evaluated for merit in the same way college transcripts currently are. Uh, this can provide a valuable incentive for veterans and military veterans, uh, for veterans and military reservists to apply for the FDNY and to know that their military experience truly matters. Uh, our second recommendation is um, that incentives for disabled veterans must not be used against veteran applicants. Civil, civil service points are awarded for veterans and, and more points are awarded for veterans with a disability rating from the VA. Um, disability is it's a personal matter and it's protected by the ADA and by HIPAA. Uh, it must never be assumed that if a veteran is retrieving, receiving treatment for a condition incurred in her military service that she cannot perform uh, every duty required of her as a firefighter. Um, we've, uh, we've heard anecdotal evidence uh, as well as there's a current lawsuit uh, regarding a veteran who was, uh, who was essentially penalized for claiming that, uh, that he did the right thing by seeking out help and seeking treatment for post-traumatic stress. Uh, you know, and you know, that's experience and that's uh, recovering from that experience uh, and he was penalized for that disability rating even though it does not impact his ability to, um, to accomplish uh, the, uh, the role of a firefighter. Um, and our third and last recommendation is um, for the city to build a troops to firefighters pipeline. We have thousands of National Guard and Reserve troops who live here in the five boroughs, many of them young and committed to finding ways to serve others while also earning an honorable living. They attend drills and battle assemblies at armories across the New York City metro area each month, yet they, yet they also face illegal discrimination from employers who don't respect their military commitment by either not hiring them or making it difficult for them to at attend their military training. Um, I myself, when I, was in the na when I was in the National Guard, um, w often uh, we dealt with, um, with soldiers who uh, had problems holding a job because of their military duties. Even though it's illegal to discriminate against uh, military reservists, they still encountered those problems, still had a hard time holding a job, and I know a lot of those folks would have been excited to become firefighters had we known about that opportunity at that time. Um, you know, FDNY has an opportunity to build a recruitment pipeline with units residing in armories that might be just steps away from the nearest firehouse. FDNY and other New York City agencies already have strong relationships with the New York State Division of Military and Naval Affairs and the Joint Forces Headquarters that oversees Joint Task Force Empire Shield and other National Guard entities here in the New York metro area. Uh, this rela these relationships can surely be broadened and leveraged to foster recruitment and diversity on the FDNY. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify and pending your questions. This concludes my testimony. Thank you. We're going to do all these statements first, and then we'll we'll do questions. Uh, Dr. Porcher. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I uh, just press the button. I just hit it. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Good afternoon. All right. It's a pleasure to be here, um, Honorable Joe Borelli. Um, I really appreciate you and your constituency moving forward. In connection with today's uh, 
brief and we look at the, M the FDNY's um, diversity, I'm a prior NYPD lieutenant, I'm a prior Army officer, and I'm also a criminal justice professor at Pace University, which is right across the street. I also function as a nationally recognized criminal justice expert. So I understand a lot of the dynamics and connection with the transfer from active duty to um, the, uh, I want to quote unquote civil service, so to speak, working within the NYPD. One of the things that the city has in play, which is already put in play for, by the state, is the ability to obtain the veterans, pre the re excuse me, the veterans preference uh, points um, upon appointment. That's something that's been long, a long-standing policy by the state. However, there's a lot more proactive um, work that can be done in connection with the FDNY. One of the things, um, one of the first things that I look at is um, back when I was a member of the NYPD from um, up until 2011, 2012, the NYPD had a proactive mechanism in targeting military recruits. They actually sent a contingent of members of the recruitment division to various um, military de de detachments throughout the country. This was a nationally based strategy. It wasn't regionally based. And I found that the results were um, what, what it, well received and it upped the diversity in connection with the NYPD, um, the multicultural, I want to say the multifaceted components of um, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and women coming in to becoming the members of the NYPD. Additionally, the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs provides online assistance and lists Tom Walsh as the FDNY liaison to assist veterans. However, this is a reactive and not a proactive strategy. The Mayor's Office of Appointments is a great avenue that looks to greater diversify the hiring of New York City employees. But once again, this is a reactive mechanism, it's not a proactive mechanism. A systemic culture exists within the hiring practices of the FDNY. A panacea to this would be outreach to individuals returning from military service coupled with commissioning test taking sites and military bases to allow easier access for veterans to participate in the CBT. The FDNY, FDNY currently has a recruitment unit that regressively visits multicultural communities in New York City. However, its outcomes pale in comparison to the other city agencies such as the New York City Department of Corrections or the Traffic Enforcement Agents. Military members anticipating an honorable discharge are physically fit individuals who in many cases meet the age requirements. Additionally, diversity within the armed services is wide and deep. In December 2016, the Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, allowed women to join combat units. This resulted in several female officers successfully, successfully completing the Army's prestigious Ranger School. Women are large contributors to military service. Therefore, to target this population would greatly enhance the NYPD, excuse me, the FDNY firefighters' diversity among women. Currently, the Department of, De of Defense trains all military fighter fighters at the Ar of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines at the DOD Fire Academy located at Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. All firefighters that graduate from the DOD Academy are certified as Firefighter 1 and 2 by the International Fire Service Accreditation Congress, which is the standard bearer for firefighters. Additionally, graduates are also certified in hazardous material awareness and hazardous operations. The FDNY, the FDNY is a paramilitary organization. Therefore, this would be a great place to recruit firefighters to gain access to women capable of becoming fighter fighters in the FDNY. Additionally, this can also be a reservoir of talent to assist in the department's racial diversity as well. Firefighters among the ranks of the FDNY do not reflect the diversity of the three and a half million residents that reside in the New York City area. Women represent a significant demographic with the fabric, uh, within the fabric of New York City. Therefore, it's necessary that we proactively create a population of female firefighters that are reflective of the population. Several strategies have since been implemented in attempt to diversify the population of firefighters in the FDNY. However, the quantitative statistics reflect a lack of female diversity. Approximately 11,050 active uniform firefighters are employed by the FDNY. 
In 2016, only eight female fi firefighters graduated from the probationary firefighter school. In closing, a multifaceted approach to incorporating more women into the FDNY as firefighters is necessary. A panel consisting of the Mayor's Office of Appointments, Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs, and the FDNY should collaborate on a recruitment strategy that targets the Department of Defense Fire Academy at Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. Additionally, FDNY firefighter recruiters should target military reserve and National Guard units because these are military members who also function in a civilian environment with a robust, with a robust com, um, content of capable women and minorities. Fires are gender, are gender neutral. Therefore, I'm not suggesting to relax standards, but to proactively target military women and minorities because they're fit for the challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we call Ms. Stefanelli, I just want to acknowledge that we're joined by Council Member uh, Amphrey Sampio. who's welcome to join us on the dais if you would so like to. Uh, and now we will hear from Josefina Stefanelli. It's Sampio, Josefina Sampio. Um, um, I apologize. That's fine. I couldn't, I, um, sorry. Um, I have trouble with it myself sometimes. Uh, I started Latinas Against FDNY Cuts at the time of uh, 2003. Um, Mr. Bloomberg closed six engine companies, four of them in Brooklyn, um, and by and I've been attending a fire committee hearings since uh, since that time, and sometimes I will comment on what I've heard during the hearings or bring in other material. I have to point out the lack of gender diversity on your committee and continue from there. Um, my daughter, separate from my interest, um, became a firefighter and I've brought her up uh, previously because of the fact that she does not jump over buildings. She cannot stop bullets or turn back time. She's a human being. She's larger than me, but she drinks her, her um, smoothie and became a volunteer firefighter for 10 years in, uh, in Florida. She's a normal human being. I cannot believe that out of 8 million people in New York City, the number now is less than 1% in the Uniform Firefighter Service, who I admire highly. And if I'm in a burning building, I don't care what somebody's philosophy is, if they're a bigot or not, they're welcome to save me but there's a matter of um, income that if an industry, a, a particular career, um, has a good income source and promotional abilities, everybody should be able to access that career. In a specific matter of the lawsuit, um, I have some very minimal knowledge of it. Specifically, if it became public, even two or three of the questions that the test, the previous test had that could, that was proven to exclude people If people became aware of those facts, what are the questions that prevented people from getting into the job? That would clarify to people, yes, this was a discriminatory situation because there's been a lot of negative publicity about the lawsuit and people have been blamed for asking for equality. And it ha I have heard personally um, that the test allowed weaklings in, improperly prepared people, the standards were taken down 
the standards were, re were reduced. If that is not the case, I think publicity about the difference of the old test and now the current test um, would help to clarify to people this is why it's a fair situation now. Um, I did not know about the medical difference differential that Paul Washington mentioned. Um, another question I have specifically is uh, Regina Wilson testified. Is the department counting her as a female or an ethnic minority? I know Serena from the United Women Firefighters. Does the department double count her? Is she a woman or is she a minority ethnic person? I happen to hit at least three minority points on some scales. So um, I think I'm, I've concluded my remarks, but I appreciate the, the department and the council's continued effort to have one of the most crucial and high visibility um, and role model um, departments of the city reflect the population. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a few uh, questions. Um, just uh, for you, Kristen, first. Uh, how far out from one's uh, date of leaving the military do, do you find people start thinking about their career options after they transition out? For me, I, well, like, as my own personal example is I've, I have yet to transition out. Um, I, I came to New York City, uh, you know, 10 years ago after I left active duty uh, at Fort Drum. And I remember, uh, you know, the, the NYPD being at Fort Drum to recruit. Um, and, you know, I sort of had the idea in my head, like, oh, well, the NYPD is looking for, is looking for veterans, uh, you know, and I, felt, I felt, felt that that was welcoming. I don't recall seeing FDNY there. It could have planted a seed, um, but I think um, you, wanna, you wanna be reaching uh, active service members, like, you know, sort of, you know, somewhere like, you know, more than a year before they start to, you know, transition out because, um, you know, you put, you're putting thought to where you're going to be moving and all of this, like, you know, well in advance of, uh, of your actually getting your ETS papers uh, and leaving, leaving the base. Um, but I, I came to New York City because I wanted, I wanted to be a New Yorker. Uh, and, um, and I, you know, I ended up working in, in emergency management because that's, that's where I felt like I could make a difference. And, um, you know, and so that was, that was what, what I initially did when I came to New York City. But, uh, you know, but keeping in mind, like, I never actually transitioned out of the military completely. I, I, I'm still a reservist. And uh, it, it, your, your biggest ripe, ready pool of folks are, are New Yorkers right here uh, who, you know, they're 18 and going into basic training and coming back and, and uh, you know, they're trained. Maybe they're trained in, in skills that directly correlate with, uh, with you know, with to the city's uniform services, whether that be police or, or fire. And, um, you know, but then they go and work at like clothing stores or, you know, as cashiers here or there when they, they could be put in a pipeline to, to put that training, to put that commitment to service, to put that, you know, the youth and fitness, you know, to, to work for the city. Um, because, you know, they are spending a good, a good amount of time in military training and that's, um, that's that's just as um, you know expensive and hard to get through as college, and uh, and it should be it should be credited uh, in a very similar way. Or if they do you know a, a tour overseas, they come back and they're just looking for something you know that's meaningful in their lives. Like this, the reservists and National Guard members right here in in in, in the city, they're just waiting to be recruited into something you know really meaningful. And, uh, you know, and FDNY is, is definitely, uh, you know, a place where they can make an impact. And, uh, and, you know, maybe they have the youth and energy to, you know, if, if they're a woman, if they're a minority, maybe, maybe they're ready for that challenge of not only, you know, running into burning buildings, but, but also fighting their way to acceptance on a force that, um, that still uh, has a resi resistant culture. Um, 
you know, the military has changed a lot just in the years that I've been in. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I look forward to, you know, th to the energetic young men and women who are going to change the FDNY in the same way. You, you mentioned something to me in private, but I'd just like to ask you in public about um, b both why you believe women would be likely to join the FDNY and why you believe they m may not likely be uh, likely to join the FDNY, veteran women. So I, th I th you know, I, I think this is definitely true of women because I can speak from my own experience and it may be, may be true for, you know, for other minorities as well. But, you know, it's the double-edged sword. You have, you know, you have uh, young men and women who are, you know, committed to service and ready for the challenge of fighting for acceptance and, and dealing with a, you know, with, with a culture that, uh, you know, proving themselves as equal. You know, like, you know, a lot, so many of us joined the military. Like, I, I, I served 17 years under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, you know, in part to prove, like, I am, I am just as much a citizen. I, you know, this, the military is just as much, much mine as anybody, as anybody's, this country is just as much mine as anybody's. And I, I am equal. And you know, and it's it's exhausting. It's it's exhausting, as as you know the you know the last panel especially pointed out how exhausting and trying it is, um, you know, on your mental health and and, and otherwise. Um, but so you have folks who are ready for that challenge and who are ready to do it and make the change. But you also have have folks who are exhausted and are like, you know what, I you know I I fought through my years in the military proud of my service, but you know what, I, I need something where I'm not fighting anymore. You know, so it, it really depends on, on the individual. Mm -hmm. I think catching them, catching them at age 18, at age 20, age 22, you know, they, they're, those are folks who are much more ready to, you know, wide-eyed idealists who are ready to be part of that change. I was once one of those people too, right? Me too. <laughs> I, uh, Dr. Porsche, can, can you tell us about how uh, you were recruited by the NYPD as a member of the military and, and why it was appealing and uh, well, when I was re recruited by the uh, the NYPD, the I want to say the recruitment strategy wasn't as forward as it is now. It's come leaps and bounds. I mean, I became a member of the NYPD back in 1991, so the diversity project was just starting out, so to speak. So I want to say it was at a deciduous place. It was um, they mailed out an application to me, and I came in and I took it. But as the gentleman mentioned, um, the prior president of the Vulcan Society mentioned that the FDNY is being held to the, being held accountable based on a court ruling that was something somewhat similar that occurred with the NYPD um, I think that they've since gotten in front of it more and um, I just in terms of the recruitment strategy I think that a lesson that could be learned would be from organizations I should say, I should say um, places like the Department of Corrections where you have a far greater diversity um, of women and African Americans and Latinos and the same holds true with the traffic agents. Now also in this, I also understand that the physical component or the rigor is not as extensive as it is with the FDNY, however it's a start. And one of the things that I do see that the FDNY does is they do have a, a, a training program that they choose to assist um, potential um, applicants Kids in passing this for the run, things to that effect. But the key is the targeted demographic. And as Commissioner Nigro mentioned, his recruitment was primarily regional. It went from Fort Dix here to New York. And I just think that it needs to be on a more national level and not a regional level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Sanders? No questions? No questions, but I do thank you for your service and being here. This is, this is amazing. I'm a, a wife of a retired um, Army officer, and I spent a lot of time in Watertown, New York, and Fifth Mountain Division, and so I do thank you for your service and being here. So you like the cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you. Well, this concludes the hearing of February 8th. I didn't know the date until you reminded me. So thank you very much.